ladies and gentlemen participants welcome to the webinar as we still waiting for you non representatives join with us uh, we do hope our program will be started in a few minutes so please be prepared turn on your video and turn off your audio please use the virtual background we already sent to you in chat box thank you for your patience please uh... We can go ahead with the conference, with the webinar, because the Professor Matengo yeah. will, be, will be represented by Dr. Bukas Amis. Okay. The vice, okay chancellor, the vice chancellor is having a tight program. Okay. He has requested Dr. Maggie Bukas Amis to read his speech. Okay. So we can start. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Recording in progress. Ip. Halo, Mbak Saka. Bisa dimulai, Mbak Saka. Nanti uh, Dr. Boykes uh, Amis yang uh, mengganti uh, Pak Matenggu. Nonceng. Saya harus mengeluarkan anu word. Good day to everyone, ladies and gentlemen, all participants. We would like to extend our warm welcome to all the guests to the webinar Indonesia Africa Center of Universitas Gajah Mada, Web Indo Africa Center. And this program is organized by the Center for Economic Democracy Studies of Universitas Gajah Mada in collaboration with University of Namibia. UGM and UNAM has cooperation in the field of academic exchange has also a significant influence on efforts to improve bilateral relations between Indonesia and Africa, especially in the agricultural sector. So this day, the webinar will focus on small medium enterprise, contract farming integration, collaboration, and social protection practices for local development. I, Katamara, will accompany you as the master of ceremony, and we have a great honor of welcoming our special invited guest, representatives of University of Namibia, Dr. Boyekas Amis. Thank you, and good day to you. Honorable representatives of Universitas Gajah Mada, head of the Center for Agro-Technology Innovation of Universitas Gajah Mada, Dr. Taryono. Honorable speakers, Dr. Diogo, Professor Catur, Dr. Elina, Mrs. Masluro, and honorable moderator, Mrs. Kisha, ladies and gentlemen, all participants. Let me inform you about rules and regulations of this webinar program. All participants, we kindly ask you to display your names on Zoom meeting. Please mute your microphones. You are not allowed to unmute your mic if it is not your turn to present or speak. If your internet connection is stable, please turn on your video and turn off your audio. Please use the event virtual background that we have already sent to you. Participants who have uh, questions during presentation are allowed to use the raise hands feature and deliver your question directly or submit your questions to chat box directly and let the moderator relay them. Ladies and gentlemen, let me inform you about today's agenda. We will have speeches, photo session, plenary session, and will be ended by closing remarks. Let us kick off the program by listening the Indonesia national anthem, Indonesia Raya.
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, next program, we kindly ask head of the Center for Agrotechnology Innovation of Universitas Gajah Mada, Dr. Taryono, to deliver his welcoming speech. Dr. Taryono, can you hear my voice? So please turn on your audio or your microphone. Yeah, time is yours. Yes, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning for Namibian mm -hmm. and good afternoon for Indonesians. Uh, my Excellency, the Ambassador and the representative of Indonesian Embassy, Edwin, uh, Edwin Hook, Namibia, the representative of University of Namibia, distinguished uh, webinar keynote speaker, distinguished academicians from both UKM and UNAM who participating uh, in this webinar, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of Kajamada. It is a very good, uh, it is a very great pleasure to welcome you all in this important seminar. This webinar is the second round held by University uh, Universitas Gajah Mada to follow up the plan to establish the Indonesian Africa Center for Sustainable Development Goals, generally between. Indonesia and African universities, especially between Universitas Gajah Mada and University of Namibia. In this good event, actually, uh, the rector and the vice rector of research and community services of Universitas Gajah Mada will be with us. Unfortunately, due to their hectic activities, they apologize to all of us with the hope that this webinar will be successful and fruitful. The focus of today's webinar is small medium enterprise, contract, uh, contract farming, integrations, collaborations, and social protection practices for local development organized by the Center for Economics Democracy Studies. Therefore, before we start, I would like to express my appreciation to the center, which generously helped us to make this webinar really happen. Small, medium enterprise are not only vitally important to the developing countries, but also are crucial with their large share in advanced economic as well. SME contributes in supplying certain activities to help big enterprises in a way of producing goods and services efficiently. SME also have created the competitive state of the market, which lead to better satisfaction of consumers' needs. Another important future of SME is focusing on innovative processes, both in technology and in management. Thus, they help in forming the GDP and play a role in maintaining the social political stability in the country. According to the World Bank, they represent about 90% of businesses and more than 50% employment worldwide and formal SME contributes up to 40% of the national income GDP in emerging economies. This number are significantly higher when informal SME are included. In developing countries such as Indonesia and Namibia, only a limited number of SME are well prepared for the new conditions and increase competition in counter in global market. On the, uh, on the contrary, global market increase the ability of well-established forage manufacturers 
and retailers to penetrate remote and underdeveloped markets and makes it increasingly dif uh, difficult for SME in developing countries to survive or at least maintain their business position in the local and if applicable, global market. In emerging opportunity to reap the potential benefit of the global trade is represented by the integrations of SME into global chains of, pro of productions at various states of added value to the establishment of linkages with larger firm and foreign facilities. I would like to express my gratitude to my colleagues at the University of Namibia, especially Professor Van de Mille, Professor Matengu, Professor Gideon, Professor Nyambi, Professor Boykas Amis, and all participants for, from UNAM. And also to all keynote speakers, Dr. Monteiro from Newcastle University, Dr. Elina Amadila from the University of Namibia, Professor Dr. Chatur Sugianto from UGM, Mrs. Masruroh Sulistiawati from the International Street Consultant. I would like to thanks also to the representatives of the Indonesian Embassy at the Hook, Namibia whom I cannot mention one by one for the always support to these great occasions and also all participants for the contributions. We do hope that we can always work together to strengthen the collaborations between Indonesia and Africa. Once again, I wish you all find this webinar interesting and fruitful. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Taryono, for your speech. Ladies and gentlemen, next program, a welcoming remarks from the representatives of University of Namibia. Dr. Boykes Amis, please. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor of the University of Namibia, Professor Kenneth Matengo, uh, I would like to deliver these welcoming remarks and as Prof. Mandamela already indicated, humbly apologize uh, as something else came up. And I am also going to deliver the speech and then I have to switch over to open the um, Center for Innovation Learning uh, in teaching um, on ongoing conference of the second day as well. So uh, my honor to deliver this uh, remarks on behalf of our vice chancellor. Director of ceremonies, allow me to greet our counterpart, the president and vice chancellor of the Universitas Gajamaja, members of the diplomatic corps, representatives of government ministries, attendees from the private sector, Dr. Niambe, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Commerce, Management and Law. I believe myself is mentioned in here as well, Dr. Maggie Bierkes Amos, as the Director for Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching, uh, the local counterpart, uh, part of the team, uh, and on behalf of the University of Namibia. All our academic colleagues present here, Professor Mandamela, Osmund Mandamela, other participants that we could not recognize in terms of their affiliation, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you. Today marks one of the major steps in the implementation of the agreement between our institutions of higher learning, namely the University of Namibia and the Universitas Gajamaja UGM in Indonesia. This seminar makes this milestone, which serves as a catalyst for our relationship. As you may have noticed, the theme for this seminar is surrounding small and medium enterprises. Director of Ceremonies, it is indeed undoubtedly true that small and medium enterprises are the engine of the economy. 
Although most of our efforts to advance the progress of small and medium enterprises were undermined by the prevailing global pandemic of COVID-19, we are still re-energized to achieve our intended goal. And this seminar is a testimony to the resolve. For us as the University of Namibia, the pandemic robbed us of our talented academics who could have been part of this special occasion that signals another level in our growing relationship. And I believe it was everywhere the same. As intellectuals, platforms of this nature do not only open avenues for us to interrogate challenges, but it also reminds us about the urgent need for finding solutions to global problems, including those in our countries that small and enterprises, medium enterprises face. Our commitment as academics is to find innovative ways, approaches, as well as strategies on how small and medium enterprises may be able to develop resilience in times of global mm -hmm. pandemic. Both our institutions have convergence in their strategic visions premised on your UGM becoming an excellent and innovative world-class university, while UNAM envisions to become a sustainable international hub of higher education, training, research, and innovation. All these commitments require that we are strategic and focused to achieve our visions. Director of Ceremonies, today's engagement sets the foundation of the Indo-Africa Center that this effort seeks to usher. In the words of Cecil Mill, I quote, the person who makes a success of living is the one who sees his goals steadily and aims for it unshiveringly, that is dedication. Therefore, our commitment to this cause is not debatable and we are determined to forge ahead to plant a seed that will yield tangible results that will help us to navigate the current challenges. Even if we want to revert to how we operated before, times are no longer the same, and this change demands adaptive systems of commerce and new skills. Once again, Director of Ceremonies, we are proud as a university to state that with the little we have in terms of resource endowments, our joint efforts make us stronger to face the future with determination. Today's event should be seen as an enabler to thinking differently and one that encourages us to continue looking for better ways of managing small businesses. It is about employing technology and adaptive systems that inculcates the element of economies of scale to production processes. As you will hear from various presenters, a knowledge economy is what will address future problems. To achieve such, our work should set the skills needed for the future labor workforce as driven by the fourth and further industrial revolutions. For UNAM, we have set our bar high as we have commenced with the curriculum transformation exercise in our university, taking into consideration skills required for jobs for the future in the digital revolution. In this connection, I therefore wish to call upon our academics and researchers from these two sister institutions to engender the ideals of impactful research for the betterment of the economies of the two countries. I will fail in my duties, uh, Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, if I do not commend the support from our shareholder, the government of the Republic of Namibia for the continued support towards our cause. In conclusion, Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to implore the private sector to come on board as well and financially support this endeavor in order for us to drive outcomes that will empower the youth through job creation and reskilling. With that, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, as well as Director of Ceremonies, I thank you. On behalf of Dr. Kenneth Kamui Matengu, 
the Vice Chancellor of the University of Namibia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magi Bekas Amis, for your welcoming remarks as the University of Namibia representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite all participants to turn on your video. We are going to take screenshots for documentation. So there are 168 participants. We'll uh, divide it into four slides. So the first slide, please, all of you turn on your video and I will lead the count and the committee will take the screenshots. Three, two, one, capture. Next slide. Three, two, one, capture. Next slide. Three, two, one, capture and the last slide three two one capture thank you for the photo session now it's time for plenary session which will be chaired by our moderator mrs kisha quarina all speakers are kindly turn on your video during the plenary session and before we start the plenary session let me inform you uh, short brief biography of mrs kisha quarina kisha received her master's degree in development economics at the University of Sussex, United Kingdom in 2012, and a PhD in economics from Lancaster University, United Kingdom in 2017. Her PhD thesis examines the scaring effects of unemployment and economics in activity in the UK labor market. Before joining Universitas Gajah Mada, Keisha worked as a lecturer and researcher at the Department of Economics, Universitas Indonesia. And she also used to work as a junior researcher at Lembaga Demografi, Universitas Indonesia. Keisha joined the Faculty of Economics and Business of Universitas Gajah Mada in February 2021. She is currently an active lecturer and researcher. Her fields of interest specifically are labor economics, education economics, social protection, and any other development and economic related issues. So ladies and gentlemen, I hand over the session of presentation and discussion to Mrs. Kisha for two hours. All right, thank you very much, Mrs. Kotomara. That was a very warm welcome and a fine introduction. Thank you very much. Right, um, so Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen in Indonesia. Good morning to those in Africa and Europe. Good evening, perhaps, and good day to everyone uh, anywhere around the globe who's joining us today. Um, the Honorable Representatives from Universitas Gajah Mada, University of Namibia, Honorable Speakers, Committees, and all participants. Uh, once again, I would like uh, to have a warm welcome to everyone to today's Indonesia Africa Center webinar on the topic of small medium enterprise held by Pusat Studi Ekonomi Kerakyatan Universitas Gajah Mada in cooperation with the University of Namibia. As being introduced by uh, the Masters of Ceremony, Mrs. Kotamara, my name is Kisha. I'm from Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Gajah Mada, and I'll be the moderator of today's plenary session. But before proceeding to our main event, I will just kindly uh, remind everyone about several housekeeping rules for this plenary session so it can go smoothly as we want it. Uh, first, um, just to remind everyone, all the participants, to make sure once again that your microphone is unmute because sometimes, you know, uh, misclick, then uh, everyone can hear whatever background that you have in our office. And then I would kindly ask everyone to rename their Zoom profile with your name and if possible, your institution as well, which uh, will be important during the Q&A sessions for us to introduce you with your name and also your institution. Um, yeah, I think that's basically uh, about the housekeeping roles. So um, in this plenary sessions, we will have uh, all of our four presenters to present their materials. 
And then uh, after all presenters have presented their materials, then we will continue with the Q&A sessions after all, present, uh, present their, uh, after all presentations. Um, and during the Q&A sessions, uh, I think the Master of Ceremonies have uh, explained this as well, but again, just to remind everyone. So to all participants, uh, when we have the Q&A sessions to ask questions, you can uh, use the raise hand button in Zoom. And once I call your name, then you may unmute your microphone, but uh, please uh, put your microphone on uh, unmute uh, sorry, uh, mute it, sorry, mute it uh, before I call your name. Uh, once I call your name, that you may unmute your microphone to ask your questions. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so that's why it is very important for us to ex uh, uh, address your name and institutions. So uh, please make sure you have renamed your profile with your name and institutions. Uh, alternatively, uh, if you want me to read your questions, although I usually encourage participants to ask their questions directly, but yeah, you can also use the chat box to put your questions um, to the speakers, right? All right then, so uh, moving on to our main event. So today we have five remarkable speakers that you don't want to miss for sure, both from the academics and also practitioners who are going to share their knowledge, experience, and expertise with us today. But before I invite our first speaker, please allow me to read a brief of introduction of each of our speaker. So um, yeah, I would like to start to introduce and uh, also have a, a read a little bit of uh, CVs and introductions for our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker, uh, we have Dr. Diogo Souza Monteiro. Apologize if I mispronounce your name, Dr. Diogo. Uh, so Dr. Montero received his master's degree and PhD in resource economics from the University of Massachusetts, USA. Dr. Montero is a food business economist with expertise on the economics of information, consumer behavior, and supply chain coordination in the food industry. He uses survey and experimental economic method to investigate consumer acceptance and willingness to pay for nutrition, origin, and sustainable attributes of food and preferences of contracts between parties in food chains. Uh, Dr. Montero successfully led multiple dis uh, disciplinary and international teams investigating sustainable diets and more recently about the urban farming. And Dr. Montero is currently a senior lecturer in oh, agribusiness management at the Newcastle University, United Kingdom. So uh, welcome, Dr. Montero. Thank you for joining us, uh, joining us today. Uh, I believe uh, he's here somewhere. So yeah. Hello, Dr. Montero. Are you here with us? Okay. All right then, so yeah, uh, I assume that Dr. Montero is here with us. Right, um, so, okay. Can the committee please make sure that everyone's microphone is muted? Uh, I'm sorry, can I proceed with the introductions of speakers? Uh, the community, could you please? <laughs> okay, there you go. Right, uh, I'm sorry about that. So proceeding uh, uh, to introduce our second speaker. So uh, we can have like five straight presentations after my introductions of the speakers. So our second speaker, uh, we have Professor Chatur Sugianto. Professor Sugianto is a professor in economics at Universitas Gajah Mada. He received his master's degree in economics from University of Alberta, Canada, and a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Illinois, Urbana, USA. Professor Sugianto uh, was also an agricultural attaché for the Embassy of Indonesia in Brussels, Belgium from 2013 to 2016. Uh, he is currently the director, the director of the uh, doctorate program in Economics Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Gajah Mada. So I believe you are here, Professor Chatur. Pak Sukian, uh, Professor Chatur, thank you for joining us today, Professor. And you're going to be the second speaker. 
Okay. All right then. Uh, thank you. So for our third speaker, we have Dr. Elena Amadila. Dr. Elena is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Namibia in the Faculty of Enterprise Development and Management. Dr. Elena received her master's degree from the University of Namibia and a PhD in Development Finance from the Stellenbosch University. She is also a research fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study in Stellenbosch, uh, South Africa. Dr. Elena has an interest in development finance, education, and disability studies. Her latest publication focuses on access to land and agricultural incentives for the youth in Namibia. So welcome, Dr. Elena, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then. And then for our fourth and fifth speakers, um, so I believe it, there will be a joint uh, uh, presentations from Ibu Masrurah Sulistiawati and Nadir Omar Ulat. So Ibu Masrurah is an alumni of Magister Management, Universitas Gajah Mada. She is an export practitioner, export marketing, and business developer. Uh, Ibu Masrurah is the owner of uh, Maiswera Basket. Uh, Basket is a uh, small medium enterprises. And Ibu Masrurah is also the CEO of Seve Belindo International. Uh, meanwhile, Nadia Ulat is a business practitioner who concerns about the small medium enterprises with over 25 years of experience, promoting the SME businesses between Indonesia and Belgium since 1997. He is the founder of Belindo Association, the CEO of Barabas BVBA, and the CEO of the Bulwula. So welcome, Ibu Masrurah and Nadir. Thank you for joining us today, Ibu and Nadir. All right, thank you. All right, then. So that's my brief introductions uh, about the speakers. Now moving on to the main event of your presentations. So each speaker uh, will allocate, we will allocate around 20 minutes for each of your presentation. I will let you know if the time is almost up. And yes, I'm a very strict uh, moderator in here uh, because we have five present, uh, presenters. I need to make sure that uh, you guys, are, uh, we, uh, we, we follow the, the, the timeline in here. All right then, so without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Diego Montero to deliver his presentation. And uh, Dr. Diogo Montero will uh, present about the um, contract farming and rural development in Africa, benefits and pitfalls. So Dr. Diego, are you here with us? Uh, Is Dr. Diego in here? I don't see his name though. Ah, okay. So shall we jump to you, Prof. Chatur? Is there any confirmations? No, no I haven't received any confirmation yet. All right, then. So shall we jump to uh, Prof. Chatur, if you don't mind? You're going to be the first speaker then. Okay. So no we're going to proceed. All right, oh. then. So Prof. Chatur? Oh, sorry. Uh, is is he here? Wait a second. He's sending me an email. Just ah, okay. Okay, why don't we start with you, Prof. Uh, Prof. Chatur, okay. and yeah, then yeah. we will uh, we will we can put uh, Diego after your presentation if he's uh, going to present after that. So again, twenty minutes on the clock, Prof. Chatur, and the clock uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Kisa, for a very nice uh, introduction. Uh, the title of my paper is uh, "Contra Farming in Practice in Yogyakarta." I'll take the the case of cacao farming. Is it visible, my presentation? Yes, but it's clear. Okay, yes. Uh, well, uh, here I'm kind of, a, you know, uh, half of practitioner and half of academician. <laughs> well, I'm uh, taking this case uh, because there are very, uh, there is a very, there are many interesting things. Uh, the first one is that, well, uh, cacao, is a non-traditional cash crop in this area, in the uh, uh, western part of Yogyakarta. Uh, it is it was a government pro government program, and it, uh, well, I don't know the reason, but that uh, it might be because of the promise of the price and also 
you know, the growing export of cacao at the time back uh, 20, 20 years ago. Okay. And uh, with that situation, the, the government at the time, when they introduced the program, they promised to absorb the produce. Okay. But uh, later on, it was not realized. So uh, cacao in the West, western part of Jakarta, Jakarta becomes, you know, like a free market where, you know, everybody can uh, produce and also uh, sell the product. Okay. Uh, there is another, another fact that there is no chocolate factory nearby Yogyakarta. And there are in Jakarta, which is uh, uh, like 560 kilometers away, and also in Surabaya, which is 300 something kilometers away. So uh, there is no way for the farmer to sell the produce to directly to the factory. And we know that uh, we are small farmer in the sense that, you know, they only have like half, maybe maximum one hectares per person. And so with that situation, uh, cocoa collectors or traders uh, come into play, okay? There are many of them. And when we check uh, how and where they, they send the product, they just uh, tell us that, well, we sell it to the factory and no other information about where run the factory and so on. Okay. So that's uh, the shit situation. I know that the current name, there are many, you know, small uh, cacao producer, I mean, cacao uh, processor near uh, Jakarta, but, uh, the market is already, you know, spread out. I mean, uh, the player, the, the number of trader, uh, the region is so uh, spread out. Okay, so that's the the current situation. And because of that, uh, the the life of the people is in part rely on the cash crop. Okay, so cacao is only one of the the source of income to the people. Uh, and they have. Padi, rice padi. Uh, they also have other local produce, and they also have small livestock, of, you know, a goat, a chicken, and so on. And that's a usual, uh, you know, livestock for uh, people in, the, in this area. So uh, with this uh, other products, the, the time that is uh, spent on the cacao, of course, is, is reduced, is limited, and also the the effort to process the product as well. So farmers just, you know, keep the plantation and then uh, let them the uh, fruit go and then, uh, you know, sell it to the collectors. In fact, uh, each on trading, we're selling the produce while not ripe yet, is, uh, you know, practice in this area. For, to the farmer, this is the, the very easy source of cash from the from the traders from the collectors there's no administration there is no warranty and then there's, there's no such uh, problem at the beginning so it's very easy to get uh, the money from this okay. but uh, the thing is that uh, we know that this is only the market for raw products okay it doesn't matter whether the farmer fermented or non-fermented, and they have the same price. So there's no grading, uh, there's no quality mixed with uh, uh, different quality and so on. So, and uh, with that quality and with that so many uh, traders, farmers can get maximum uh, to 20,000 per kilogram, so raw, okay. so like 1.5 USD. And they they can basically they can uh, freely sell the the, the products to any collectors, but because of the each on trading system, they actually tied uh, to the specific collector. So there's a specific uh, relationship between the farmers and also the collector, where you know the collector gives them a, a credit for the uh, you know the daily uh, needs and so on. 
Now, after 20 years of the program, I found that the farmers are already old, right? I'm getting, I'm getting older and farming is not the first choice for the use in the village and cacao trees are not well maintained, basically. So these, uh, going back here, these are one of them, okay, the, the middle. And this is me and it is our uh, partner in this in this area. So, okay, so, he is also concerned about the uh, the continuation of the uh, the trees as well, but you know uh, that's the situation. Okay, I found uh, that there's one uh, uh, lady over here, uh, food crafter who tried to process the cacao, uh, uh, but uh, he's good in the sense that they only uh, accept a good quality of material. mentioned uh, he or she then gave a specific uh, requirement okay so she said that okay uh, the farmer group if you want to work with me then we have to follow the rule okay so they do the grading they train the processing so that now we have first grade and second grade of cacao of course uh, with that uh, grading system uh, she Give a premium price. So the first grade we got uh, forty thousand, so it's like twice, and then the second grade got thirty thousand. There is no formal contract uh, at the moment, uh, but you know there is a very close relationship between uh, the uh, farmer group, farmer group, and and, and uh, Miss uh, Dwi Martuti in this case, that the lady that I mentioned. So uh, I said there is there is only yes or no deal approach here. Take it or leave it approach. You you say yes, you have to closely follow the process, processing guidance. Uh, you you send all of the produce to this lady. She guarantee that all of the produce will be absorbed. So well, actually the farmer become a no free farmer actually. But with that. Uh, with following the guidance and following the rule, they have better price. And also they have a you know warranty of the market. Okay. What about site selling and contract default? Well, I know that there's no contract, but you know, this kind of relationship. Uh, the lady, uh, the uh Dwi Martuti of here from a woman farmer group. Okay. So uh they work together with the wife of the farmer and, and taking care of, uh, you know, other activities. Many of them are not related to cacao uh, processing or you know, chocolate processing. Uh, some of them, you know, uh, producing fried based snack like banana fried, cassava fried, and even uh, there's also uh, Gender is this an ice sweet dessert that contains droplets of green rice flour jelly, coconut milk, and palm sugar syrup, and so on. So, uh, and also there's also a lady who uh, you know serve a, a cater for food and other you know simple party uh, party purpose. Okay, so I found that with this farmer group, actually the wife who observe the behavior of the husband in managing the cacao. So instead of having a formal contract, uh, she has a informal contract in the sense that, you know, with this uh, woman uh, group, farmers, woman farmers group, they have specific, uh, you know, observer to the behavior of the, the farmer. So with that, uh, the farmer keep the contract. They keep, you know, uh, managing the, the cacao trees uh, based on the guidance that they agree on. Okay. Uh, Ibu Dwi uh, has the chocolate-based cafe. So this is the kind of uh, activities that they have in, uh, in a group. So 
any big order to Wendy's, the chocolate uh, peace cafe, they can have uh, us for uh, these other women to uh, support and uh, so to supply the food, to supply the the snack and so on. So if there's uh, one office or two has uh, some uh, meeting in, in the cafe, so everybody has their own business. I mean, they, they can support this activity. So they can have a uh, cacao or chocolate, and then they can they can have chendol, fried uh, snack, uh, even also uh, big lunch in that area. So with this kind of uh, collaboration, uh, both the cacao business and also the uh, local economy business uh, can uh, continue to operate. So I found that this is the kind of, I call it integrated activities where, you know, the uh, farmers, farmer group who organize activities, not only based on uh, cacao, but uh, based on their preference, the activities of the, uh, you know, the farmer group preference in managing the uh, business, but lay, uh, link to the, the main activities that Ibuduti uh, has, Ibuduti has, where she is processing the chocolate and also uh, have a contract with the uh, farmer. So still uh, the, the mothers, at their own business, they take taking care of the business together, but they can also become the you know uh, observer of the peer of the, the the farmer, the cacao farmer as well. So with that, uh, it come it turned out that the the cacao or the raw cacao that is supplied to uh, to Ibu Dwi, uh, is uh, have very good high quality. So she can produce uh, chocolate one this with a nice taste and also high quality. So with this type of collaboration, with the type of informal contract, we can we can have you know the local economic activity running and you know trust and also high price, uh, you know. Uh, Warranty of the quality and a warranty of uh, uh, the market are there. Okay, I heard that uh, she is uh, starting writing the, the the formal contract, but it's not yet signed. So that's the one of the practice that uh, I introduced to the audience. Uh, I hope this is a good start for the discussion uh, in terms of how to uh, build up the uh, integrated farming, to build up the local economic activity based on the contract, based on trust and help the farmers to increase the quality and also warranty a certain price, such that all of the people of the participant gain uh, profit or gain additional income from the local economic activity. I think that's uh, all I have today. Uh, thank you and enjoy the chocolate. <laughs> Not the coffee, but the chocolate. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Prof. Chatter. Um, that's a very concise presentation. So thank you very much. And yeah, it's very appetizing when I hear your presentations. Yeah, I think <laughs> we need to drink and eat chocolate after this. So a very uh, insightful and appetizing uh, presentations. So moving on, uh, I think, Diego is still not here with us. So uh, if I can ask Dr. Elena from University of Namibia as our second speaker, Dr. Elena, um, are you ready with your presentation? Yeah. yeah so, yes. uh, all right. So Dr. Elena will present about the role of social protection functions in, agricult uh, in agricultural small medium enterprises as instruments to curb food insecurity in a pandemic. Examples from selected countries. 
Right. So while uh, Dr. Elena is preparing for her presentations, I would like to remind all of our participants again about um, putting your questions on the chat box if you prefer to do so, or yeah, yeah, you can use the raise hand button at the end when we have the Q and A sessions. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elena. Twenty minutes on the clock, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um. All right, um, good morning to those in Namibia, good afternoon to those in Indonesia, and um, perhaps good evening to other people in other parts of the world. All right, um, thank you for the introduction, and i um, like to welcome everyone here present today. My topic for this, um, for today will be the role of social protection functions. Um, and how these functions could play a role in agricultural small and medium enterprises um, as um, instruments to keep food security in a pandemic. So we'll look at few examples from um, a few countries. I would like um, to start off going through what I'll be talking about. We'll briefly look at the importance of agricultural SMEs. Um, identified problems in agriculture in Namibia before and during the pandemic. Well, then we look at briefly what um, is the theory behind what could those problems that are currently experienced. We we'll look at um, why it is social protection and why combine social protection and agriculture. And then um, look at practical examples of how this has worked in, in, in different countries in the world and then conclude the presentation. So I'd like to start off with the words of um, the then uh, president of France, um, Nicolas um, Jacorsi, who said, economies fare better when there are efficient social protection schemes because they help improve worker productivity and promote balanced and sustainable growth. Building up a social protection flow in each country will take time. But certainly we cannot impose upon the poorest countries the standards and social systems of the wealthiest, but progress must be made. Um, why do we start off with this, with this particular quote is because I find it relevant when we talk about um, social protection and agriculture to say, yes, we can, we can look at examples from different countries. And of course, different examples cannot, um, apply exactly the same in all countries, but of course we need to start somewhere. And I think this is a step towards starting somewhere, towards making that progress with this um, current presentation that we have. So look at, look at what do we mean by um, agricultural SMEs. When talking about agricultural SMEs, you're saying an agricultural SME is oh, an agri-business, um, a small business that's involved in agriculture can be thought of as any agricultural business that fit the general definition of an SME for any given country or region. But um, since this study um, particularly focuses on the Namibian context, in Namibia, the, uh, um, the general definition and not just the, the, the small medium enterprises in farming, the general definition of a small medium enterprise we are saying um, is those enterprises that um, you look at the number of employees that are less than five, have a turnover of, of, of um, US dollars of about 20,000 annually, and the capital employed should be about 8,117 USD. But because we are focusing on agricultural SMEs, here we adapt the definition of Agricultural Bank of Namibia that refers to enterprises that are small, medium, and involved in agricultural production as opposed to small, medium scale enterprises. So small scale farmers are those who are farming on three to six um, hectares and medium scale farmers are those who are farming on 12 hectares. Although literature has argued that it, it should be cautioned on defining SME strictly on the basis of land because then we, we ignore other factors when it comes to access to markets, access to the capital that they have. And therefore um, for this particular research that I did, we, we, we should look at or for this particular presentation, we should think of an agribusiness SME as that 
that has, um, of course, considering the size of land and other factors when it comes to the type of income that is made in the capital and the number of employees. Um, now, what is the issue when it comes to um, agricultural small medium into uh, small medium enterprises or small scale farmers? It's ironic that those who produce food or small scale farmers are the ones who are also more prone to poverty and hunger. And you would expect the opposite to happen, right? For someone who produces food, you expect them not to starve. But unfortunately, the ones that produce food, and the reality is that they are the ones who are more prone to hunger. And as the consumers who buy the food, we, we can say we are fairly better off than those. And why is this the case? Um, the problem is that when you look at those who are farming, especially the small scale of farmers, before the pandemic, and by the pandemic, with um, talking particularly or specifically, uh, when we look at, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic that's, that's um, in different countries uh, uh, present. Um, before the pandemic, there has been, as much as we have small scale farmers in different parts of, of the country, low agricultural productivity has consistently been cited as one of the main agricultural sector challenges. Um, of course, this is not unique to Namibia as other farmers, for example, in Uganda, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Malawi, and Tanzania are also subject to risks and shocks and, 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 and face difficulties um, in accessing markets, which do not always function properly. And sometimes they simply um, do not exist, um, these particular markets. Now, with Namibia being an arid and semi-arid country, um, it becomes even more difficult given those challenges that I just mentioned that I also experienced in, in other countries because um, drought has had severe effects on farming. And um, one of the effects is that, for example, farmers experience a very steep increase in production costs um, due to drought as low, low rainfall results in, in, in Lower river levels, for example, which increases the power, what that is electricity that is needed to pump water to irrigation sites. So it's a triple effect, or oh, it has, um, if, if one doesn't have access to electricity or water, it, it affects other things as well. For example, the return that one is going to get there and the livelihood strategies thereafter. Um, this is not. Now, during the pandemic, given those challenges that were already there before the pandemic, between July and September 2020, when COVID-19 hit, around 428,000 uh, people, um, that is about 17% of the population, particularly in Namibia, faced high levels of acute food insecurity or worse, um, including 14,000 people uh, in emergency. There were specific regions in the country um, about, um, seven regions that were classified as regions in crisis, while the remaining um, seven analyzed regions as stressed in a stressed situation when it comes to food insecurity. And the main drivers of this acute food insecurity are prolonged um, dry spells that were already there, of course, before COVID-19 and subsequently loss of income due to economic activities that most of them um, they put on, on, on hold because of COVID-19. So there is still projections, or there was projections that between October 2020 and March 2021, around 441,000 people were to be in, in, in crisis when it comes to food um, insecurity. Now, during the pandemic, COVID-19 restricted economic activities, which subsequently resulted in loss of employment, sharp decline in market prices, and a lack of access to agricultural inputs. Now, one would say in a pandemic, if farmers experience this type of hunger, given those statistics, you, you might as well conclude that they'll prioritize consuming the seeds that they produce as food over planting seeds for tomorrow, which then raises the threat of, of food shortages later on. And that is a concern if um, it comes to the situation of consuming um, seeds rather than actual food that they're supposed to plant um, for tomorrow. Um, when one of the interviews I had with one of the small scale farmers um, that um, recently in one of the irrigation sites um, in, in, in Namibia, 
one of the challenges that they have, for example, when I said, given the, the, the situation that the country already experiences, it's an arid and semi-arid dry, dry country. One of the farmers um, provided or gave me this information, and this is a direct quote from one of um, the small scale farmers who say, if you look there, and this time he was showing me one of the, the, the his small scale site or his farm where he's producing or farming. So he said, if you look there, I only have two rows of corns left. The rest are destroyed because there's a lack of water, but having water here is not up to me, but up to the government. But I'm expected to pay back every cent, everything, even though I have not produced enough. Um, when, when you look at, or when you listen to such concerns of um, not having enough produce, but then one go get a loan from a bank, for example, yeah, they are expected to pay back at a certain time with regardless of when um, that produce, whether someone has produced something or not. Of course, there are efforts that are made in the country, they say agricultural bank of the that that's set up to provide finance and a whole lot of others, but there are some issues that are not considered as to does that farmer actually has the income to start paying back this loan, um, looking at areas like issues like land, water, markets, and all those um, um, issues surrounding farming. Now, what could what theory could explain most of these problems um, that um, small scale farmers experience? Um, the theory of market failure. Um, explains or provides an explanation to some of why some of these issues uh, experienced in agricultural, particularly for small scale farmers. And when we look at market failure, we're, saying, we, we, we're looking at it as an equilibrium allocation of resources that is not um, well allocated or Pareto optimal as economists will call it. So the Pareto optimality or efficiency paradigm states that for microeconomic efficiency to be achieved, there should be no room to make one person better off without making another person worse off. So markets fail because of the dysfunctional nature of price systems, as well as the structural imperfections. For example, market power, the abuse of market power, externalities, imperfect information between the, 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 the the farmer and, for example, the financial institution and, and public goods, for example, um, there tends to be an overconsumption and underproduction okay, of goods without any intervention when you look at produce, for example. Now, how does social protection come in? Social protection is a set of intervention whose objective is to reduce social and economic risk and vulnerability and to alleviate extreme poverty and deprivation. The, the argument is that social protection generally can, in all uh, uh, um, sectors, can, can shrink extreme poverty and enhance food security while also building household resilience in terms of crisis and stimulating rural households to invest in agricultural protection. So therefore projects that combine elements of social protection, including agriculture, tend to emphasize broad poverty and vulnerability reduction goals relative to those projects that do not include social protection. And for social protection to work and to, to, to really achieve that goal of reducing vulnerability and poverty, there need to be four functions that in, in place or um, four things in place that, that should be looked at. They should be protective functions, it should be able to protect in this case, for example, small scale farmers, making sure that they have income, um, some benefits or state pensions that they would, they would get from, from the, the work that they do. There should be pre prevention, things to prevent things from happening before, then a reactive function, waiting for things to happen and then that's when you take action. There should be some kind of social insurance in place, but also there should be um, a, a promotive function um, where farmers, for example, um, are given some kind of incentives or inputs to help them with the, with the production. Even water here could be a promotive function, electricity and all those type of things, but also a transmo transformative function, which could include, for example, the labor laws um, that protect 
um, these small scale farmers to encourage them um, in the business of, of farming. So when agricultural interventions are coupled with social protection functions, you would find uh, that it provides liquidity and certainty for farmers, allowing them to invest in agriculture, reallocate labor to own farm activities, invest in human capital development, increase partic participation in social networks and better manage risks, thereby allowing farmers to engage in more profitable livelihood and agricultural um, activities. So the current gap in the literature is that most of the literature on government efforts to finance agriculture and social protection comes from those countries, particularly Latin America and Asia, and very few come, for example, from African countries. This could be attributed to the fact that many Asian institutions are frequently suggested as, as models for successful government interventions in credit markets. And why, the question is, why some works in other countries, but, but, but not in others? Um, um, so, for example, the international um, the, the international finance corporation disseminated the best practices of microfinance that have successfully implemented agricultural lending operations coupled with, with social protection, which targets agricultural smallholders in Latin America and Caribbean. So, which measures and programs then to adopt during COVID nineteen? Look at um, we look at few examples. For example, in Brazil. Um, how did they, um, in terms of incorporating the social protection functions that I just um, briefly went through um, one or two slides earlier. So with Brazil's interventions and lessons to pick from these that market failures and chronic raw poverty in Brazil has prompted government intervention in domestic food markets to connect large predictable markets to smallholder production thereby utilizing the protective function of social problem. It's therefore one way of intervention took the form of structured demand to take care of poor access to markets. So this connects, this methodology of protective function connects large predictable markets, such as provision of food to schools and hospitals to create a market from, for smallholder farmers. The government also intervened um, this from, um, through the creation of the food acquisition program in the national school feeding program um, as a way to create uh, the problem of access to markets in those countries, but also the provision of unsubsidized loans at market interest rates against a note that is issued by the farmers to avoid issues or to, to, to avoid having problems where, where farmers cannot get a loan because they don't have collateral or they don't have, um, yeah, some kind of security to pay back that loan. So there are some of those challenges where were dealt with through the promotive or the, yeah, the promotive function or to promote farmers through looking at giving them unsubsidized loan, but them giving a guarantee or a note that they're having these funds by in the next two years, this is what I, I would put on the table as, as, as produce. And this is what um, will have a market that is definitely, of course, the government assists in creating that market for the farmers, and definitely that produce will be will be um, will be sold for an income um, to the to the producer. Um, Brazil also promoted agriculture for small scale farmers through the construction of reservoirs to do with the issue of water problems and related water infrastructure. And as a result, so as a result, there were pro programs of social assistance the construction of a network of 700,000 rainwater storage, an increase in average household income and um, other social policies, example, rural retirement, the food acquisition program and the purchase of school meals. Of course, they also transformed agriculture um, through inclusion of, of small scale farmers, which allowed farmers to make a leap forward in productivity by adopting um, upgrades um, how was the inclusion, uh, you may think, how, how was the inclusion aspect taken into account? Um, when you're talk, talking about the transformative action, it's about doing something that is different from um, how things have, have been done previously. So, for example, um, one way in which the, the Banco de Brazil, a bank in, in, in Brazil, promoted agricultural production in Brazil, and, and, and of course contributed, for example, to increased access to finance way through the provision of 
unsubsidized loans, like I, I, I mentioned. And with this method of financing, farmers are more likely to invest, improve their technology, or seek out new buyers um, to deliver their products. And of course, there was insurance that was provided, of course, to farmers against all types of risks as, as a way to promote the preventive function of social protection. For example, there's a crop insurance program that was started in 2004, and that has pr pr protected or prevented a lot of things from happening and losing income for farmers from, for example, protection from flood, hail, drought, pests. Etc. that could destroy um, the produce. In Costa Rica, for example, the government responded as a result of COVID-19 by building oyster farms to generate jobs for over 24 families that have lost jobs as a result of COVID-19. So this was coupled with a promotive and transformative function for social protection by providing technical support and training on how to, to open Instead of just saying, okay, we are going to build farms and we're going to have a job, but does someone have the training? Does someone have the technical support to actually do what they're supposed to do? So there was technical support and training as regards to how to calculate, cultivate oysters and basic management tools to the families that were going to work in those farms for an income due to jobs that were lost. If you look at, for example, Indonesia, um, government, there was the... the, the the agriculture, the um, government has intervened through government finance purchases, for example, price support of rice to farmers. And therefore, subsequently, there was a guaranteed price for rice producers in Indonesia, which stimulates farmers' output and leads to a protected agricultural sector and securing of farmers' incomes. Um, of course, in order also to increase limited quantities of subsidized credit to farmers, the interventions in Indonesia, there was policy efforts in the farm credit introduced, well, which, improved, which led to the improved provision of fertilizer subsidies. Of course, there was also a move from the credit subsidy. It, it, the, the, I, instead of just focusing on, yeah, let's give credit loans money. Instead of looking at credit subsidy, there was a move from that to rather a market determined credit allocation, um, which continued to focus on income expansion and poverty reduction. Um, and when you look at that kind of support, which instead of just relying on subsidies, as long as the government intervention is directed towards improving the legal and the regulatory framework, adapting appropriate govern governance arrangements and having management principles for interventions allowed one to reflect that a new and a more promising approach to rural finance. Um, of course, the formal market allocation um, approach makes the case also for cost-effective alternatives, such as increased invest investment in rural infrastructure or in human development, unlike the credit subsidy that aims at um, the, um, for example, the short-term um, approach or that aims that looks at rather the credit um, alone. So, what is currently happening. For example, in Namibia, when you look at the situation that is currently happening in, in, or, or from the literature of what has happened in Indonesia in the past, even prior to COVID-19, it has been found that lending expertise on how really to, to lend to agriculture. Yes, there is support, there is interventions in the country, but you find, do we have designed lending expertise that's particularly for farming? Given that that is, a, 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 literature is one that is a challenge, for example, the training that is received through the Southern African Development Community at the Development Finance Institutions Forums does not necessarily focus on agricultural finance, but rather focus on financing development industries in general. Um, this is, for example, from one of the interviews um, I did in the past with one of the agricultural banking institutions in, in the country. So, Lessons um, on how that could work. For example, in Indonesia, in Indonesia invested heavily in irrigation and actions were taken such as increasing the quality of intensification, increasing cropping intensity, expanding planting area to cater for an increase in population and improving agricultural infrastructure and facilities. For example, including uh, irrigation networks or water um, challenges and improving food diversification. Um, as a result. 
So that allowed for a preventive function or to prevent, to protect farmers, just like the case in, in, in Costa Rica, Brazil, for example. Um, for example, in Indonesia, there was introduction of Farmer Protection and Empowerment Act as one of the key elements in adapting the climate change and supporting the development of agricultural sector. And Indonesia has therefore provided a good example to show that the raw finance can be profitable when it does not rely on subsidies, as long as the government intervention also allows the environment for legal and regulatory frameworks for a, a, an appropriate governance arrangement. So in conclusion, um, it's important to highlight that it's important for governments to create enabling environments by employing social protection functions for their farmers in order to boost local produce. Of course, that needs to take into account the functions of social protection. And that is important now more than ever, especially now during COVID-19, when food insecurity and the number of people who um, have are worried about where to get their next um, meal as a result of loss of jobs and those uh, things are currently happening. It's important that um, social protection be coupled with many projects. It, 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 of course, not just looking at, of course, the goal, you know, is to reduce vulnerability and poverty, but also consider all the functions actually in place and not just one or two. So the risk of the spread of COVID-19 is high when a country has to rely on food from beyond its borders. In addition, different countries where food is produced are giving priority to their citizens first, especially the citizens that have lost their jobs due to COVID-19. And therefore countries have to find ways on how they can deal with their own produce first rather than relying on a country that's also dealing with their own citizens. So it's therefore about time that social protection functions are employed so that issues leading to market failure are minimized and social protection is maximized to secure food for local citizens. And I conclude this presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Alina, for a remarkable presentation because uh, Professor Chatur finished early. So I was giving you more time because it was very interesting, but we will continue on the Q&A session. So please stay with us. All right, then, um, I think we do have Dr. Diogo Montero joining us, uh, if I believe so. Uh, Dr. Montero, are you here with us? Yes, uh, hello. Uh, hello, uh, right. Uh, yeah, I'm so- Sorry well, for, uh, for the slight delay. I got a bit confused with, uh, with the hour. Okay. Um, shall I start? sharing my yeah. presentation. Uh, yes, Dr. Montero. So I have introduced your CVs actually at the beginning because I thought you were here. So apologize with that. Uh, I didn't check right. whether you were here or not. So um, yeah, so I believe you're joining from the UK then. Um, it was yes. supposed to be your turn, but now I'm going to give you the turn. So the time is about 20 minutes, Doctor, if that's possible for your presentations. And I will let you know if the time is almost up. And uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Montero is going to present about contract farming and rural development in Africa, benefits and pitfalls. So 20 minutes on the clock, doctor, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank, doctor, you. thank you. Dr. Elena, may I ask you to uh, stop sharing for your presentations? Thank you. Just bear with me a second. Oops. If I want. Right. Does everybody see it? Yes, it's clear, Doctor. So I'll maybe put on the full screen. That will be better. There you go. Uh, well, uh, first, uh, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, depending when or where you are in the world. And uh, again, thank you so much for first the invitation to participate in this very interesting uh, uh, workshop. Um, and uh, again, particularly thank you for uh, Professor Suyanto for uh, in inviting me. And, and again, I apologize for arriving a bit late. Um, to be honest, I, I got a bit confused with, with the timings. Um, so uh, the title of my presentation, my presentation is, is, is I'm going to talk about contracts and I'm going to talk more, more you know, in general about contracts and what contracts are in, in, in economics from an economics perspective. And, um, and what are some of the issues that uh, uh, 
my colleagues and I have been looking at. There's a lot of recent work on the role of contracts in rural development. And I think uh, Elena already did a, a great presentation uh, showing some of uh, the issues that uh, um, Africa is facing, uh, and particularly uh, um, smallholder farmers. Uh, I think this complements a, a bit uh, and provides a bit more background uh, on, on uh, what Elena just uh, shared with us. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't worked as extensively in Africa as I would like to. Uh, I had a, a, a PhD student that did some work, uh, but actually most of our work was, was actually based on lab work here in the UK. So I'm not going to share a lot of my own work, but uh, hopefully we'll give you a bit of background that, that will allow us to get a bit more uh, uh, insight into the problems that Elena was just talking about, namely in terms of market failure and how contracts can uh, potentially address some of those market failures, but also what are the problems that contracts also have. Um, I think you've introduced me, so I'm not going to uh, spend much time in here, but I'll just start with, with the basics. You know, what is contract farming? What, is, what are contracts? And then talk about two different types of contracts that uh, traditionally have been used uh, in, in agriculture, so tenancy, versus marketing uh, or, con or contract farming contracts. Uh, talk a bit about formal and informal contracts and the consequences of these types of contracts. Uh, and, and then, you know, talk a bit about why, why farmers contract and then some of the issues. And, and some of the issues are theoretical issues. So model hazard and adverse selection is certainly an issue that uh, potentially hinders the effectiveness of contracts. Uh, and associated to these is something that I've been working with my students uh, which is site selling and contract default, which is a major uh, uh, origin and driver of some of the issues that we, we, we have uh, in the developing world and particularly in Africa uh, um, on, on developing supply chains that, that can increase uh, incomes uh, in, in to, to, to smallholder farmers. There are some issues we need to be, be careful about um, the type of farmers that we address. And, and, and I think some of the issues that we, we, we face and hearing a bit uh, the experience from others um, it seems to me that um, maybe a smaller farmers are not prepared um, to participate and take advantage of some of these opportunities that are emerging uh, on, on participating in suppliers pools um, and, 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 and have but the benefits of contracting. Um, um, so, so that's how I'm going to be concluding is, 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 is some lessons uh, that um, academics uh, have been learning uh, from uh, studying contract agriculture in Africa, uh, some of the benefits and some of the pitfalls. So, so that's sort of a, a summary of, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but let's start with 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 sort of um, the basics. Um, and I think it's when we talk about the topic, it's very important to start with clear definitions uh, of what we're talking about, so that we are clear. So, what is a contract? Uh, I'm going to talk about contracts from an economic perspective, not from a legal perspective. So every lawyer that is uh, on the on the um, assistance, uh, please forgive me. I mean, obviously, you know, lawyers might have different perspectives on this, uh, and it would be interesting to, to, to learn about that uh, in the discussion. But for the, for an economist, a, a contract is simply an agree agreement between two parties, two agents, who have a, a reciprocal commitment in terms of their behaviors. So uh, if I'm a farmer and I enter a contract to supply to a buyer then the buyer agrees that he will pay me a certain amount. And it might be that part of that amount is, is paid up front or not. Uh, and I'm, as a farmer, I'm committed to, um, you know, uh, sell to that uh, buyer and, that, and to that buyer alone uh, my produce. So, so that's, that's an example. Uh, now, the problem with this is that there's a lot of behaviors that are associated with this. And, and, and often it's not uh, possible to, uh, to contractualize all the possible behaviors that the two agents have. And, and this is one of the issues that contracts may have. So uh, in economics, what contract theory actually examines is, is, is optimality. What are the optimal conditions uh, in which a contract should be designed? Um, so again, an example there again is, is, is typical contracts that we all have with our employers. I mean, we, 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 an employer offers a wage and maybe some benefits uh, to which we exchange with, with performance of a task or a job that we have to do. Um, now, interestingly, contracts have been used, used in, in agriculture for a long time, uh, and there are many different types of contracts. And I'm not going to be um, 
bothering you with, with all the types of contacts that are uh, uh, in agriculture, uh, I'm going to just uh, uh, um, summarize two, two sort of uh, types of contracts. But the advantage is really that they, they reduce uncertainty on the transactions. So with us uh, in competitive markets, you go to the market uh, and um, you, know, you will have to sell at the prevailing price uh, whatever you have to to offer and, and there's an assumption that you know they won't you don't won't necessarily ever meet the person that you sold that product to in context there's there's uh, um there's more of a, a connection between two people uh, uh, that that then agree uh, on on that transaction um so that's that's uh, uh, um sort of the fundamental difference so in a way contracts are, can be seen as as an alternative to um, to sales in, in markets and particularly spot markets uh, um, that that have been traditional uh, used in, in 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 all sorts of forms of of human uh, transactions and your and the organization. Um, so in agriculture, uh, a very traditional form of contract was a tenancy agreement, and this type of contract is a contract between a landlord, somebody that owns the land but don't doesn't necessarily want to farm that land. And, and a farmer, which has expertise on how to grow a crop or how to uh, grow animals, and, but doesn't have land, doesn't have the resource. And so there's then a, an agreement between the landlords uh, uh, and the tenants. Um, and uh, the landlord obviously wants to have some return on the use of the land. And there's the different ways that this return can be produced. And of course, the the, the farmer uh, um, wants will 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 get some income from from selling the produce, uh, the production that he obtains from using the land from the the, the from the landlord. Now, if you kind of start thinking a bit deeply about this problem, uh, obviously, you know, there's different ways to to address it. Uh, in the limits, uh, um, the landlord can just employ the farmer and just uh, hire him as an employee. Uh, and so it becomes, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, an employee, and so so it has some control over him. Or they can remain independent, and then with that, um, the landlord can can agree a fixed rent. Uh, they can agree to share the crop, the value of the crop. Um, now the problem with here is that, as as Elena was was alluding, there is a problem of of information in here. The, the tenant, or sorry, the the, the landlord, he will know. Uh, the characteristics of the land. He will have some knowledge on how fertile the land is. He will have some understanding on whether there are uh, um, access to, to, to water, for instance, that could be used uh, for irrigation. He will have that knowledge and that knowledge will be specific to him. On the other hand, the farmer will have specific knowledge about his ability to grow crops. He will have specific knowledge about his networks of, of potential buyers. So uh, how that information is revealed to each other, uh, it, it becomes a problem. And, and, and how they use this information as well uh, can, can lead to problems in the contract. So, so that's an example of, of, of a contract that has been established in most parts of the world of, of, of these type of contracts and how, how you divide the pie, how do we divide the resource, the, the, outco the output? It's, it's typically the, 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 the economic problem that we are looking at, but also how do you reduce uh, the, the, the information asymmetries that there is ex exist between these two um, agents is another, th another issue that economists have been thinking about when trying to establish an optimal tenancy contract. And then there are farming contracts. And, and by these, I mean contracts that involve the sale of a product. So this would be uh, the sale of product from a farmer to a, a, a buyer downstream. And this buyer can be a retailer, can be a... a um, a processor of food can be directly the consumer. Um, so that there's different types of, of farming contracts, uh, but typically, you know, they involve uh, selling a commodity. Now, in here, the problem is is what is the price, and maybe also uh, whether the buyer um, gives credits to to the farmer, whether the buyer, and how much control does the buyer wants to have in terms of the quantity and the quality of the product that is provided by the farmer. So uh, these types of farming contracts have, have been the ones that have been promoted extensively uh, in recent years by different international organizations and by governments as a means to obtain uh, um, rural development, particularly of smaller farmers in developing countries 
uh, in after as well. But as I will, I will, uh, uh, you'll see in a minute. I mean, there are problems associated with these contracts that might actually hinder uh, uh, the, the, the possibility and the opportunity that these types of contracts have to uh, create uh, uh, wealth uh, in 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 in, um, in some of the unfortunately poor poorest uh, regions in the world. Um, one of the problems that uh, there is often uh, in developing countries is that there are not uh, very strong uh, formal institutions that can be used to enforce the contracts. So, uh, so this leads to this distinguished distinction between complete contracts and, uh, and incomplete contracts. Um, and so complete contracts are those for which the mutual commitments, the, the mutual behaviors that each of the, the agents uh, involved in, in, in the transaction on celebrating the contract, uh, all the commitments are observable by a third party. So that uh, if there's any issue with the contract, if there is any conflict, then a third party will be able to observe uh, um, all the actions that each agent have done and decide who is right and who is wrong uh, and, and, and sort of find out some sort of compensation so that the, the, the contract can be completed. Um, and so by, the, by completing a contract, we mean that, uh, you know, uh, the transaction is, 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 is finished and, and uh, the buyer, if it's the case of the buyer, uh, gets the product uh, and he pays the price agreed to uh, the, the, the seller, the farm, for instance. Um, but uh, uh, the reality is that uh, um, a lot of the contracts um, are, even in, in countries where there are uh, very sophisticated institutions, uh, often, um, often it is often the case that uh, there, there's some of the commitments that each person has uh, isn't totally observable. And, and, and you can think about our own jobs as, I mean, I'm an academic, you know, my, my university can't observe everything that I do. Uh, I mean, I'm now talking to, to, to here. I could be just uh, on a coffee shop having a, a nice time and talking to my friends. And it probably would be very hard for them to actually determine whether I was talking to a, a, an academic audience or whether I was talking to, to my friends over, over Zoom at this time in the morning. Um, so, you know, so, so, so there are a lot of, of, of circumstances where, uh, and in fact, some argue, uh, uh, some economists argue that there's no such thing as, as a complete contract ever. Uh, uh, because there's always parts of the behavior that, that are not observable uh, by, by anyone. Um, so this leads to, to some problems, because uh, if it's not possible to, to, um, to observe and verify all the elements of a contract, then it might be impossible to contract. Um, so, so there needs to be some other mechanisms that make the contract enforceable. Uh, so uh, we know that this has been happening in, in most parts of the world. So it's not, it's not only laws that made, con made contracts uh, um, uh, complete. There are sometimes informal relationships, social norms. Uh, uh, there's our pride. There's our uh, uh, trust in each other uh, that actually lead us to um, do uh, what we're supposed to do, even if it's not going to be observable. You know, and it goes goes back to these stories of 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 uh, of, 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 of of honor and, and and what do we do? What we're supposed to do, regardless of who's observing us or not. And 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 all all cultures have these these ideas of of what do you do when when all of a sudden, if you had this ring that would make you disappear, would you do the same actions or not? And and in fact, I mean, most of us, and in fact, experiments that uh, my colleagues and I have been running. Uh, Suggest that in most cases people do the right thing. So yes, uh, a lot of the, um, the the conditions that to have contracts working are are not verifiable, but still those contracts uh, in most cases uh, work fine. But anyway, so just to kind of give you an idea, there's a particular type of contract that uh, economists, particularly and coastal economists, have been uh, particularly focusing at recently is this idea of a relational contract. So. Yeah, and, and, and by a relational contract, we mean a contract that is celebrated between people that have a relationship that they, they keep meeting uh, often. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, what characterizes a relational contract, um, which often uh, uh, um, you know, overcomes some of the issues uh, that limit uh, incomplete contracts, uh, are the fact that, they, that there, are, there is repeated interaction between parties, 
which is essential to build trust. Uh, there's often unwritten contracts, so it's handshake type of arrangements. There's implicit obligations, not explicit obligations. Typically, in legal contracts, there's explicit obligations. We, we have a, a set of written rules that and, and, and obligations that we put. In this case, it's, it's not often the case. But unfortunately, one of the, the, the drawbacks of these incomplete contracts or these relational contracts is that they are prone to default. Uh, so often, one of the parties fails to deliver. And, 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 and we need to distinguish failing to deliver for the reasons that Elena was talking to us about. I mean, if I have a crop failure, I don't have anything to deliver. I mean, so yes, I was obliged to sell you all my maize crop, but I'm sorry, I don't have anything. I mean, I lost it. Um, so that's obviously a situation where there's, there's a justification for the default. Uh, but unfortunately, after also sometimes what happens is that when there is a crisis like that, I mean, there's a drought, there's always farmers that actually uh, keep their crops uh, and though, and for those farmers, all of a sudden the value of their product increases substantially. So it might be that actually they have an opportunity to sell for higher than it was on the contracts, and often they will do that. So let's not be uh, uh, um, just uh, naive about these things. I mean, uh, farmers obviously take advantage of the situation they are, they are also are. So we need to think about that as well. Um, so that leads to the, these problems that are, are prevalent in, in, in most contracts, uh, regardless of whether they are complete or incomplete. There is model hazards, which is exactly what I was kind of describing. Is, is It occurs on, on, on when agents have an hidden action after the contract uh, that, that uh, may prevent, uh, may, may affect the other agent. So uh, this term comes from insurance and suppose that in, in an insurance contract, we are supposed to take every action to prevent the accident from happening. So if you have a car insurance, you're supposed to drive following the rules of the road. You're supposed to have to, 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 to take precaution if you not speed in, in days where it's raining a lot, all those things. So uh, so you have that moral obligation to, um, to the insurer. But of course, if you are reckless and you have an accident because you are reckless, then you, you are sort of facing a problem of molar hazard. And in fact, if the insurance can prove you that you were reckless, then of course they, they have the right not to pay uh, the insurance uh, that, that, you, that you paid for uh, and not compensate you. So, so th this happens, uh, unfortunately, quite commonly in, in a lot of situations. Uh, so that's one problem is, is when our actions are not visible, uh, what, what can happen? The other problem that is also uh, uh, emerging in contracting is adverse selection. That means that the, 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 the agent uh, contracting uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't reveal completely his ability to actually do the task that he's supposed to do. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and this is very problematic in agricultural contracts. So if, if, if a farmer enters a farmer pool, but he, he doesn't have the ability to produce Say he, he, he commits to, to produce strawberries, but he doesn't know how to produce strawberries. He's never done that before. Um, but, you know, he's just thought, well, you know, there's good money on this. Why not? Uh, uh, and then, of course, he can't complete the contract. So, obviously, uh, for, for the buyer needs to, to be able to, to, um, to force the, 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 the agent to reveal his true ability to do the, the work that he's supposed to do. So, these problems are problems that are prevalent uh, in, in, in agriculture. Um, and somehow, you know, if they're not addressed, then obviously the contracts won't be able to uh, provide the opportunities and, 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 and be a means to actually developing um, the, the farmer, the farmer's incomes, but also in the end of the day, the regional development that we, we, we hope these contracts will do. Um, associated particularly to moral hazard is the problem of site selling and price default which is quite common uh, in Africa. I mean, this uh, student of mine from Ghana uh, uh, was looking at this in, 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 uh, in the vegetables markets in, 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 in Ghana. And uh, we did find that uh, it was quite common for, for uh, farmers to, um, when, whenever you know, they realized that uh, their crop had more value than what they had contracted, uh, he, they would sell to the first person that would come to, um, to the farm. Now, there are reasons for this. It might be that people are not doing this because they're just bad people. Uh, often, um, as, as uh, uh, Elena was also saying, sometimes is the lack of infrastructure 
that leads to these things. I mean, if a farmer uh, doesn't have the capacity to store the product uh, and he has a crop, particularly a vegetable crop that goes, uh, perishes quite quickly, um, and, and if somehow the, 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 the buyer for some reason doesn't show up on the timing that it was supposed to, to show up, he will lose, uh, he'll, he'll risk lose all the crop. So if somebody else comes up and says, look, I, I can take you your crop today, um, you know, he probably will do that just because he doesn't know whether the buyer comes or not, because that's another problem that there is. That is this, again, infrastructure is sometimes not ideal. So it might be that the buyer wasn't showing up because, uh, um, you know, there was some problems in the road or something. So all of these elements uh, sometimes lead to, to these problems. But side selling is, 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 is an issue that often prevents uh, the participation of particularly small older farmers in, in more high value supply chains. Uh, but also, what we, we interestingly we start seeing, and and, and, and my my student Cosmos uh, uh, saw a bit was 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 price defaulting, and this is when buyers actually either don't show up or when they show up they they impose a lower price than was originally agreed, uh, and there is some suggestion that is actually this is becoming more of an issue than site selling. Um, and uh, and actually that that might lead to uh, uh, some of the the the, um, the findings that uh, Elena was having that farmers apparently are on a poverty tra trap and, and and maybe surprisingly some of the farmers are, are the ones that are, are more more hunger uh, although they produce food so uh, uh, so I think this is something that uh, is is being recognized and an issue and not only in in, in developing countries this is becoming an issue. For in, in in developed countries like England and the US as well, uh, and this is associated to what Alina also was um, was referring, which is market power. Uh, what what happened in in the in the last twenty years is was a concentration of of power, um, concentration of businesses uh, at both both downstream from the farm, but also upstream. So there's less suppliers of seed. Uh, or even tractors than they used to be 20 years ago. Uh, there's less uh, uh, um, manufacturers, uh, butchers, uh, uh, um, you know, um, mills uh, for, for, for cereals, uh, etc. than they used to be uh, 20 years ago. So this concentration is leading to oligopsony and sometimes oligops oligopoly kind of conditions, which, which again, sort of uh, market power that often uh, 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 leads farmers to pay more for inputs and get less for outputs. And so this is becoming uh, something that is becoming increasingly recognized. Um, so uh, what are the benefits of contract farming? Um, first, I mean, as I said in the beginning, th this has been uh, an instrument that has been suggested and proposed by the World Bank, by FIO, um, to increase uh, farmers' incomes in developing countries. So. Again, the idea is that you have a more stable income, you, have, you reduce uncertainty. Um, some of these farmers uh, contracts include provision of credit, provision of, of inputs. So that, that is a way in principle that, that it would be all the good things that we know would benefit farmers. Um, so there's the potential to increase uh, uh, farmers, but there's also uh, uh, through price assurances, farmers can have better access to credit markets. Uh, that could be potentially spillover effects for the local economy. So farmers will, will have more increased productivity, so they might need to hire extra help to, 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 to tile the, the land and to then uh, do the cropping. So that could, that could be a spillover to the region. Uh, they could, again, have access to inputs and new technology, uh, and they could also uh, potentially be included on the suppliers pool for, for uh, international retailers and, and manufacturers, which would pay more than domestic, uh, uh, than domestic supply, uh, sort of uh, networks, uh, supplies networks would. So, uh, so, so this is the, the potential benefits. Uh, but uh, because of the issues that I was telling you uh, regarding moral laws and adverse selection, unfortunately, some of these benefits are not really being accrued. Uh, and recent uh, work has been really questioning these benefits uh, that were, um, and we're kind of finding that some of the, the, the reports on the benefits in the past maybe didn't select the best, uh, uh, the best uh, uh, um, samples. Maybe they're not talking to all the people. Uh, maybe the instruments that they were using to, to quantify these benefits were not the appropriate. There were there's issues that have been uh, uh, um, 
sort of uh, raised in terms of, of identification of, of the variables that, that allow us to, to measure these benefits. So, uh, so really kind of, uh, we need to kind of look at this uh, more seriously. Uh, and uh, one of the, the problems is what I was talking to you. There's, there's, there's some evidence of hold up. So this relationship becomes too dependent and, and dependency leads to abuse often. Uh, there's also these issues that I was talking about uh, of buyers oligopsony. So buyers having the power to, to fix the prices and reduce the prices. Um, some of the contracts uh, may be leading to environmental degradation and often also to child labor. Uh, and there's some, some, some evidence that that was happening, uh, particularly in India with environmental degradation uh, and, and, um, and all elsewhere with child labor, um, which obviously is not ideal uh, and often doesn't lead like, to massive. improvements. And I'm just going to wrap up now. Uh, uh, other recent uh, reviews uh, from uh, Bellamare and, 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 and Bloem, Bloem, but also uh, by Menken and Bellamare, uh, this, this second study was a study comparing six countries in Africa where only on two of them they could have, uh, uh, they, they found clear evidence that uh, uh, um, contracts were benefiting the farmers. In all of them, they benefited some farmers that actually had already good conditions anyway, but not necessarily uh, lifted those that uh, needed to be lifted. So a lot of questions that, um, that um, need to, to, to be addressed still. Uh, so just to conclude, um, yeah. contract, farming is a, yeah, contract farming is a form of, 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 of contracts uh, celebrated typically between a, a, a buyer that, that wants to, 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 to source product from farms um and and use it on on, on to, to add value um either selling to uh to uh to consumers directly to retail or, or to the food services uh but there are issues uh issues associated to the incompleteness of contracts but also associated to moral hazard and adverse selection uh and these might lead to site selling and price default and and, and if there is extended site selling and price default then the contracts may fail and their their benefits uh, might not be uh, captured. Um, they can uh, potentially improve farmers' incomes, but we need to be careful uh, on, on creating the right institutions. Uh, and I think the ones that Elena was talking about are certainly interesting to consider. Uh, the concerns are mainly associated to hold up and oligopsily. Uh, and, and so these can actually limit the positive effects that contracting has. Uh, so a lot of work needs to be done uh, and um, to, to explore this, but uh, I think there's some of the suggestions and findings that Elena was sharing with us, uh, and I'm sure that uh, we can sort of discuss uh, uh, our opportunities. I, the, the, one of the things that I think is interesting is, is, is the use of digital platforms to, to, um, to put con uh, farmers directly in contact with consumers. I think establishing these networks, I think is going to be something exciting in the future. Also these alternative, uh, market channels, uh, not only traditionally retailers and, and food service, there's, you know, uh, uh, public procurement, there's all sorts of things that, that we can do, but also we need probably to invest in infrastructure to make sure that uh, uh, some of the, the, the opportunities um, are, are captured. So that's sort of what I wanted to share. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to reflect, uh, and, and I gave you more of a, a, a more of sort of a the theoretical perspective on this, uh, but I think it complements quite nicely with, with the more practical work that uh, Katur and Alina shared before me. So thank you. Yes. If you have any questions, uh, uh, please, please shoot. All right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Montero. Yeah, we're going to have the Q&A once we hear from the practitioners because, um, um, yeah, I think it uh, our three presenters are from the academic backgrounds mostly. So uh, we're now gonna hear about uh, from the practitioner's point of view, which will be presented by Ibu Masrullah and uh, Nadir a lot as well. Uh, the two of you will present. Um, so uh, 20 minutes on the clock and after uh, the final presentations, then we're going to open the Q&A sessions. And just to remind everyone, you can participate uh, in our Q&A sessions by uh, choosing the raise hand button or put your questions on the chat box uh, starting right now. We are, we are already open the chat box. All right, uh, Ibu Basrullah or Nadir, maybe you can uh, present your presentations and 20 minutes on the clock, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
maybe uh, Mr. Olat Madir, uh, please. Madir. Oh, Oke, okay. I... Uh, uh, I'm first, yeah. Uh, how to share the? Uh, I think we have right. made Ibu as the co-host. So if uh, if you can just click on the share screen, Ibu. Okay. Oke, okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for Gajah Mada University and uh, Namibia University. Good afternoon and uh, and also uh, thank you for all speakers and the audience. Nice to meet you here. Uh, today uh, I will I I will not give the heavy subject. I will share about my experience during I doing my business. Uh, the time, the topic today is the collaboration and contract with foreign buyer experience from Jogja Export Craft, Case Belindo. Let me introduce my uh, company first. Uh, my company name is CV Belindo International uh, with my Swara Basket Brands. We are focused on creating environmentally friendly home decoration product. Local craftsmen are involved in our production line. This is our vision. We aim to grow our business from local to global by continuing to improve social welfare to our local people. This is our tester. Uh, all of our products are 100% handmade and utilizing natural material source locally. We work with uh, local craftsmen located in Wates, Pulau Progo, Yogyakarta, Indonesia. Uh, They have a weaving skill to produce uh, the home de decoration product. This is our product, 100% handmade, unique, environmentally friendly products. As a small medium enterprises, I realized that uh, I have so many uh, problems when I want to go global. So this, uh, today I will share five issues for an SMS. One, how to find the buyer. Second, how to deal the business. Third, how to prepare the product for how to do the shipment. And five, how to handle after sales. We go to the first issues, uh, how to find the buyer. There are so many ways to find the buyers, but, uh, in, uh, but today I will give you five ways uh, to find the buyer. Uh, I have a website, marketplace, exhibition, government, and association. In the modern art, people are using their mobile phones more and more to browse the internet, find out about business, and even buy products and services. With a website, customers can easily access information about your business. They can see what products or services you sell, your price, your location, and much more. Also with the marketplace. Online marketplace allow you to sell goods without setting up your own website. eBay and Amazon are examples of well-established marketplace. We can use that. We can use these uh, tools yeah, to promote our products or service because we, uh, we can reduce uh, financial thing to promote our company. And exhibition. Before pandemic, we can join the exhibition offline. But uh, since pandemic, there's no uh, offline exhibition. But uh, don't worry because there's uh, many program about uh, international virtual exhibition. The benefit of exhibition uh, include raise awareness, meet in person, and also networking. Uh, with the join uh, international virtual exhibition, you can show the work that the company or your business still exists. Government and association. 
when I uh, start to go global, I jo I decide to join with the association uh, we, which connect with international market because uh, the association is a forum for SMA to gain access to uh, information about business development opportunities. It also help assisting small business enterprise to grow by providing information and resource that match their specific need. The association is also a bridge between SMEs and the government so that the aspiration of SMEs can be delivered to the government. Uh, I joined with the Belindo Association, which is uh, uh, developed by Mr. Nadir Olat Omar, uh, and Belindo helping SMS to grow locally, expand into new markets, and remain competitive in an increasingly, increasingly complex and evolving global marketplace. I also cooperate with government. Why government? Uh, in the current knowledge-based economy, small enterprise become one of the most significant drivers of economic development, employment creation, and poverty reduction. Government plays a crucial role in small and medium-sized enterprise. They can support with grants, research centers, regulation, and tax incentives. Uh, government can cooperate with association to support us as an SMA uh, for international exhibition. And uh, without them, maybe I cannot go global easily. For more information about Belindo Association, uh, Mr. Nadir will uh, represent after my presentation. Or you can search uh, uh, all information about Belindo Association on the website uh, www.belindo.au. And the second issue is how to deal the business. Many companies use product, product catalog to give consumer to chance to see a small sample of products in person. When you think that product description and image file to explain the product, a sample can help the buyer in understanding the product better. Product sample play a crucial role in the buyer's buying Decision. This is because sample provides a close image of the product and helps in winning over the buyer confidence. Be clear about the cost of the sample before promising the buyer that you will provide the product sample. So when you get the buyer and they ask about the product sample, give them the best product you made. Uh, after product sample, pricing is the important competitive weapon which influence companies' success in foreign markets. By better understanding international market environment, a company can more effectively set price and be competitive. Maybe at that time, buyer will compare your price with another company or uh, other country. But don't worry if you sure that you have a good product with a good quality, uh, you can tell them that I give you the best price with the good quality. You can uh, give them a price with FOB, freight on board, CNA, cost and freight, and cost insurance and freight. This is a time of payment after product sample uh, price. We go to the term of payment. Export payment terms are a crucial part of international trade based on which uh, exporters and importers decide how the final payment is to be processed. This is for how, uh, this is for both term of payment. Number one, uh, I'm sorry, this is not LCL, but LC, letter of credit, case against document, CT and B2B payment. You can choose one of them based on uh, your negotiation with the buyer. This is the information. And next issue is how to prepare the product. For SMA, uh, product quality and delivery time is the most important things. 
uh, and how we prepare the, the product. It's about material, packaging, and how to finish the order. Material preparation is the most important things in product preparation. To meet the needs of raw materials, we can ask for help from the university as an educational institution such as like UGM or uh, University of Namibia, which provides a lot of information about the location of raw materials and local treatments, which are usually found in research journal about regional potential. By, ut by utilizing this research, SMA can shorten the time for product preparation uh, and also for packaging. Regarding good packaging, we can use information from journal issued by universities such as the Jamada University or uh, Namibia University. The last importance is the accuracy of product deadlines. Uh, you have to create a matter work schedule complete with the deadline of the product. In our case, there are several things to consider when making a deal, such, a winter, such as the winter and planting season. The weather is very influential because the drying process of our products is very depend on the weather. Most of our craftsmen are farmers. So when the planting season arrives, they will ask for permission to grow crops, which often causes order to be delayed. So the solution, uh, like I said before, the, to create a mature work schedule complete with the deadline of the product. And next issues, how to do the SIP one. There's uh, two ways, LCL, less than container load, and FCL, full container load. The main difference between FCL and LCL is that the buyer is sharing space in a container for, for an LCL shipment compared to renting the full container space under an FCL agreement. Usually for SMA, we, we uh, consolidation here with the LCL. Last but not least, uh, how to handle after sales. The importance of after sales service uh, reflects your image and professionalism, demonstrates your ability to handle your customer problem and to solve them. It is your duty to do everything possible to satisfy your customer regardless of the situation. Therefore, the management of your after sales service must be fluid, organized, and optimal. I will give you four key elements to managing your after sales service. There are shipment monitoring, payment monitoring, and keep your customer well informed and complaint management. Uh, I will give you my uh, PPT. And I think for me is enough. Thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, now, Mr. Nadir, you can presentation about Belindo Association. Okay, thank you, Bu Masrova. Uh, so, Mr. Nadir, are you joining us? Um, yeah, uh, I still cannot contact uh, Mr. Nadir. Uh, I try, um, can I try again, Mr. Nadir? Would you like to present about Belindo Association then? I think he's here. I saw his name. Yeah, he's here. He's, he's just not responding. Uh, that's why I think uh, I, I already uh, messaged him as well. So, um, yeah, uh, shall we proceed then uh, to the Q&A or Ibu Masrura while I'm uh, uh, reminding our participants if you could uh, contact Mr. Nadir whether uh, he wants to present about uh, Belindo. So yeah, everyone, so we already have like three presentations from uh, three remarkable uh, presenters uh, and one presenter uh, just now from Ibu Masuro, um, her experience and her experience as the practitioners and um, also as the owner of the SMEs uh, herself, uh, which is very valuable uh, to all of us, of course, and to uh, add on into our uh, discussions later on. Um, all right then, so we're supposed to have one more uh, presenter, Mr. Nadir, to explain about uh, the SMEs associations of Belindo Association. Uh, but just to remind everyone, while we're waiting for Mr. Nadir's confirmation, um, you can start 
putting your questions on the chat box uh, and uh, put uh, or choose the raise hand button if you would like to ask questions and uh, participate in our Q and A sessions, which uh, will open uh, very uh, very soon once we get the confirmation from Mr. Nadir. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, yeah. Is there any confirmation, Ibu Masulah, maybe? Or um, I try, uh, but... Uh, it's not responding? Yeah, yeah. that is fine. Okay, right. Um, so why don't I open the Q&A sessions first? Uh, and uh, let's see if Mr. Nadir is going uh, to respond uh, our uh, message to him. Right. Um, so yeah, I will open the Q&A sessions now. So uh, again, just to remind everyone to raise their hands or uh, put their questions on the chat box. So I would like to read the first questions for Dr. Monteiro. Um, wait, let me just, um, well, I would like, yeah, I think I'm just going to read the first questions uh, to Dr. Diego uh, Monteiro. Uh, the question is, do you think the contract farming problem also found in developing countries? I'm wondering whether the site selling and contract default are also similar to problem in developing countries. I'm wondering whether the site selling and contract default are also similar to uh, Two problem in developing countries. Sorry, um, uh, repeating. Um, and to Dr. Elena, uh, the questions for you, doctor. So the government failures sometimes happen in this contract farming. Just like uh, Professor Chatur mentioned, the government fails to keep the promise. How to reduce this possibility of government failure in this case? Is there any penalty for the government? And the question, uh, the two questions uh, was still inferred from uh, Sugia from uh, PSEKP. So I think um, I will like to have Dr. Diogo to respond for the questions about uh, whether it's a possible there's a similar pattern for the developing countries and then uh, for Dr. Elena is regarding the government failure. Thank you. Uh, right, I mean, it's not very clear to me what, what you're asking if this is prevalent in developing countries as long as well as developed countries or, or, or only on developing countries. What seems to me is that uh, um, it is an issue in in, in developing countries, uh, and it is particularly an issue when uh, when you're trying to have uh, um, building sort of uh, agri business, uh, which which can be sort of a way to add value to uh, regions, uh, and uh, and so for instance, in the case of of, of of Ghana, which is the one that I know a bit better than others uh, just because you know my student was from there uh, and and you, you constantly told me that uh, the government actually invested uh, also in international investors on 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 processing plants namely for tomato um, because the regions uh, or some of the regions in Ghana had high potential for the production of tomato but then there was always a problem with uh, assuring enough supply of tomatoes for processing. Uh, and often the case that he was telling me is that um, there used to be lots of, uh, of, of crop failures and, and, and farmers that, that you know, wouldn't be able to deliver uh, uh, for one reason or another uh, uh, the, the, um, the product. And, and these types of processing plants, they need at least on the time that they're operating, they need a constant flow of products because each day that uh, they stop, they will lose money. Uh, and therefore, then it creates some uh, 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 sort of a, uh, a vicious circuit in that um, the farmers don't, don't, are not able to provide to these, to these plants the, the quantities and the qualities that they require. And because of that, they start getting trouble, the, the, the processing plants, and they start paying less to the farmers. And that creates just a circle that, you know, in the end of the day, uh, um, all the, the, the farms events, the, the, the farms, the farmers don't get the money they should get, but also in the end, also these processing plants need to, to close. So Ghana has two or three huge plants that could be generating a lot of, 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 of income to farmers, but also to, to other employees and et cetera. But then in the end, in the end of the day, get closed. So, so this is, this is a problem uh, that, that exists. I mean, I have colleagues uh, from the States that work, uh, 
in, in, in Africa in general uh, with other type of processing uh, of soya, for instance, and all of that. And that's something that is a problem. Now, I think what sometimes we forget is, is what is the root of this problem. Uh, and it can be, uh, you know, again, lack of infrastructure, lack of capacity for farmers to produce what is supposed to be produced. Uh, um, again, there might be problems in terms of, of, of even corruption in, in the different levels of supply chain. Um, so, so, so that's that's that, that that's an issue that that seems to, to be prevailing. Um, in what is interesting now is that there's some evidence more recently that these type of, of, of behaviors maybe not as explicit uh, as as in developing countries. But they are still emerging uh, in, 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 in here, uh, uh, in Europe, and sometimes in, in, in America as well. So recently, um, I found that um, uh, a retailer in, in actually, it's, it's a retailer with, with Portuguese capital operating in Poland. Uh, they, they've been sued by the, the, the Polish government because they were uh, renegotiating contracts after the supply of, of I think, was fruits or vegetables, something like that. Uh, so, so these things are, are, are problematic. And partly, as, as, as I said, I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's the concentration of market power in certain parts of supply chain seems to have uh, some impact. There's also uh, uh, some, some stories that emerged recently uh, of similar situations with international buyers putting pressure on, on, on prices for cocoa producers uh, and coffee as well uh, in Africa and elsewhere. Um, so, 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 so this seems to be an issue that um, is, 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 um, is not entirely sorted and can have clear effects. Uh, one thing that I think it's interesting is, is what um, the latest speaker was telling us about is one way to controvert this is to try to find other ways to, to, um, to uh, diversify your, your products first. I mean, so obviously the farmer, some of the, the craftsmen's, craftsmen's that uh, uh, Matsuri was talking about, they are also farmers. So if those farmers have another activity that can sort of provide some income, then it might be that this, the, they are not so dependent on just one buyer. And this can actually be an opportunity to, to, um, to address the market. But also there's increasingly uh, some really interesting uh, exper experiences of uh, local, uh, say, coffee shops in the UK and elsewhere that directly buy from a cooperative of, of coffee suppliers uh, elsewhere. There's always the problem of, of how do you get the product from one place to another. But I think uh, that there are really interesting sort of solutions that are starting to emerge uh, even in terms of finance, uh, that I think uh, are things that we need to be paying attention. So yes, that there is on that sort of traditional transaction, there are still uh, some issues, some associated to market power, some to other uh, features uh, of markets. But I think there's also uh, some interesting opportunities uh, to celebrate other types of contracts. And, and actually, I was kind of wanting to know a bit more about uh, how you, what problems are, are you having uh, Mazuros uh, about contracting with your suppliers, but also how you contract with, with your buyers. So that, that, I think that, that, I mean, hearing more about that, uh, I think would be really interesting. All right, thank you, Dr. Montero. I've, I've noted your questions for Ibu Masruro, so we will definitely hear uh, her answers uh, uh, very soon. Um, yeah, I would like Dr. Elina first to uh, answer the second question so about the government failure. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for this question. It's, um, I like it. Um, the challenge is it is how, how is the penalty for, for the government failure? Um, no. Question of whether there is penalty for the government. Um, look, there is an um, argument that um, the so-called logic of market failure needs um, government interventions because markets fail um, because of also institutional weaknesses that are there. They are not, they don't have right um, mechanisms in place first because if there are no, I think th there needs to be a line between where the government ends and where the market um, intervention will begin because combining the two, I think that is where the problem comes in. Now, what um, 
what penalty is there for government failure? Well, it's a question I cannot uh, provide an answer to in terms of what penalty is there when governments fail. But of course, the penalty, I'll say there will be there are indirect penalties. There are indirect penalties because if the right mechanisms are not in place, for example, in that case, it, it reflects on the government in a negative way because you have farmers in the country or small scale farmers or medium scale farmers in the country who are not producing where there's no productivity in the country, no food production, no, you have citizens that are in stress situation, food insecurity, they cannot, you cannot work while you're hungry. And that affects the economy of the country and that has a reflection on the government as well. So I think that's an indirect penalty for the government to, to really look at these things. That's what I'll uh, how to it, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you, Elena, for your answer. Um, so can I go to Ibu Masrura? I think, uh, yeah, it's Is interesting. May I join? Oh, yes, Pak uh, Chatur, sorry. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it's mentioned about uh, the contract between government and farmer. I think that's a good idea, uh, as government also experienced a failure, right? And, you know, uh, I don't have any... Uh, you know, uh, reference on them, but uh, usually, uh, you know, penalty uh, is will be in the form of losing trust from the farmer. Mm -hmm. So it will be difficult for the government to introduce new program once farmer was cheated. Yeah. So this is a lesson mm -hmm. for the government to formulate new program completely. Like, uh, you, you know, usually they giving uh, farmer a seed or fertilizer, down to the marketing of the world that otherwise effort to increase the farmer income will be failed and you know any other new program from the government will be well, well farmer will will not follow the program if they were cheated at the first time so that i think that's that's uh i don't know is, it, is that direct or indirect penalty to the government okay Okay, so okay. it's like a game theory. Once you oh, cheat well, it, yes, then right. yeah. <laughs> you will get zero profit because you have that uh, track a bad track record. I'm sorry, Dr. Montero, would you like uh, to say something? Yes, uh, um, I think the problem of, of government failure is, is a big one and it's often neglected. Uh, I think we normally focus on market failures um, and 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 you know, and use that as, as a means to say, well, you know, markets don't work, so let's just uh, try to figure out another governance. Uh, and, and I think it's, we need to, that's, that's a really good point. We need to acknowledge that governments fail. Uh, and, if, and, and, and again, partly is, is it, much as markets, if there is too, con too much concentration of power, then, then typically people will abuse, regardless of whether they are a, 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 private or public servants or public organizations. So, so one of the issues is, is the lack of scrutiny and the lack of opportunity. So that's what I think it's really important uh, to kind of have different types of institutions that, that can sort of uh, uh, compete in one way or another. So one way potentially to use this is if, if you're having, uh, uh, um, you know, agricultural produce and, and, and if the government can buy some of that produce, uh, through you know programs that buy products for, for schools, for instance, but at the same time, there's also market uh, uh, commercial agents, private agents that are buying the same product, say for restaurants. Then obviously one is is sort of uh, uh, controlling the other, uh, um, and there could be more opportunities for the farmer as well. But you know, again, let's not forget that the farmer is not an angel. I mean, the farmer will also abuse if he can. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think the only way that that this works is, is if, if each agent has has a bit of a, 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 a has to be considered for the other ones and the only way to do that is to make sure that not, none of them has, has, has complete power uh, because that the, typically the, the, the problems come from one if one agent seems thinks that he can get away with it uh, we can get 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 away with with either sort of moral hazard or adverse selection issues then, then obviously they, they will do. Uh, so I think this kind of keeping checks and balances in the end of the day, I think are, are the way to, to do this. Um, and I think this is the problem that we are facing nowadays. I mean, a lot of governments uh, and businesses don't really think that they, they need to coexist with other organizations. They, they can't, they don't exist alone. 
Right, thank you, Dr. Montero. There's actually, uh, okay, so I'm going to go to Ibu Masrula to uh, share her experience, but there, there are actually one question that's related actually, is about the um, the gender issues, especially in the farming and then uh, the SMEs as well. Like, uh, well, uh, although when I saw Pak Chatur's slides, uh, all of the, uh, I think most of the uh, uh, the slides con consists of uh, women farmers, uh, which I think is a good uh, picture, but then the issue with uh, gender, uh, there's still an, uh, unequal opportunities for them well quote unquote in the um, um, in the SMEs and also in the agricultural sector so um, yeah I think um, if I can ask Ibu Masrura you as the practitioner and you're a female and uh, yeah um, as a gender economist myself as well I think the, uh, I mean uh, the, the current literature is still uh, highly debating about the bottleneck issues for uh, women participations in SMEs like uh, getting um, the um, uh, uh, the financial uh, and the loan from the banking system given that uh, they do not have prior track records so Chatur says if you have a bad track uh, track records uh, you will penalize, but uh, for those who still hasn't got the first uh, the first experience, and they also face the same issues, uh, and they do not uh, they do, do not have the, uh, the capacity or maybe the ability to uh, to get a loan to start uh, the SMEs in the first place uh, because they do not have threat report, and uh, maybe it's also related to what uh, what Dr. Montero just mentioned. The bank might uh, perhaps uh, afraid that this uh, new um, a female uh, debtor will be default in the future. So uh, they kind of, you know, uh, uh, avoiding of adverse selection. So Ibu Masuro, um, would you like to share with us, you as a female, uh, how did you uh, make the contract and how did you, uh, you know, uh, get involved in this SMEs? Uh, for my, thank you, Ma, for the question. Mm -hmm. For my experience, uh, for get the funding yeah financial things for the bank bank didn't see uh, the gender okay uh, mm -hmm. they see uh, uh, they see about our business they will come to our workshop and sh uh, show the activity and they will give us the uh apa namanya penawaran uh, offer offer they credit offer, offer. Mm -hmm. yeah credit offer so, but uh, did you uh, start with Belindo or did you start on your own in the first place? I start with the uh, Belindo and start with the SMA. I, okay. I have a business and I joined with the Belindo when I start to go global because I know that if I do it by I doing by myself without collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult for an SMA. Okay, so do yeah. you think the collaboration helped you a lot? Yeah, and yes. Perform your SMEs. Yeah, because uh, when I collaborate with the association and association cooperate with the government, they have a program and support us to go to promote our product or business with an expo, with an international expo. And at the time we can uh, promote our product or our service to the world. Okay, right. So, um, uh, the bottom line, I, or, or I think the most, uh, I think one important message in here, I think it's good if you collaborate with an association. I think yes. it's it's going to help your, uh, you know, uh, your business to uh, move forward and give you more opportunities than yes. with international opportunities. All right, thank you, Ibu Masrura. Uh, Pak Chatur, we have a, a questions for you actually. Um, so the questions uh, comes from uh, Ibu Petri Wijayanti from Brand. Uh, she asked you, many agricultural commodities in Indonesia are grown on government project basis and many of them do not have processing unit or downstream industries. Even if there is, it cannot absorb all production. On the other hand, the middleman bids at a low price. Moreover, when the institutions is in the village or region, uh, they are unable to facilitate to solve the problem because of bureaucratic uh, problem, corruption, capital, or human resource, uh, limited human resource problem. So in your two cents, Chatur, how to overcome the, this complex issue? Oh, thank you. That's <laughs> that's not a uh, simple question. Okay. Uh, uh, but I found that there are many ways of, uh, you know, farmers, groups and also farmer collaborate with the uh, process of themselves they can you know reduce that uh, kind of problem you know, you know that when they get together and then they have a 
bigger size of product, then they can you know uh, try to deal with the processor as well. Okay, so uh, I think uh, if the if the farmer themselves and also the uh, the government try to encourage this kind of a uh, you know farmer group, either cooperative or just a group. And they can keep, you know, the promise of about the size, the quality, and the time, and that kind of, you know, uh, quality requirement. Then uh, they will have a better position and better deal with the uh, processor, actually. So uh, it's true, like uh, Ibu Masrur mentioned, uh, lonely, uh, you know, farmer or lonely crafter is very difficult to go global. But also, even though we are living in a new technology, we know that uh, it's not uh, in the farmer's uh, domain for you know using uh, gadget to sell the produce online. So I think we need we need a farmer group. Or we need a, a very good entrepreneur who can help a farmer group to you know uh, expand the access to the processor and also to the market. Okay, thank you, Pak Chatur. I think uh, it's interesting if we can proceed on that topic as well. But I would like to invite uh, Bapak Taryono to our discussion session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Moderators. First, I would like to ask to Dr. Monteiro. Uh, I think in the case of Indonesia, there are different uh, contract farming system, but uh, I can uh, divide into two. One is, I call it normally in the, what do you say, in the food, uh, food growers, they, uh, they contract the land, yeah? they, they, they contract, uh, they, they are contracting the land for somebody else. But in the case of estate crop, normally we call it uh, the uh, uh, product contract farming. Means that the industry, they will, con uh, they will buy the product from the farmers. Because in the 83, 87, I think, the government introduced the NES program. Uh, so it is about the nuclear uh, estate system, I think. When the industry, especially for estate crop, they should, uh, what say, they should work together with uh, the farmers as uh, producers. Uh, do you think that such kind of uh, product contracting uh, system can be also introduced to the, uh, what you call it, to the land contracting farmers? Because I think it is more will be more beneficial to the growers, to the farmers. And the second, about the government filer. I think the Indonesian government in the last five years, they introduced about farmers insurance. The government will take the responsible theoretically to the farmers failure, especially during the, uh, especially for the uh, har harvesting failure. And now, uh, nowadays, I saw there are, it is, uh, I think the last question is to Pa Chatur. We saw that there are now so many, what do you say? So many hub, so many uh, different, uh, what do you say? Uh, different- uh, Marketplace? Young, young people who develop okay. a kind of e-commerce like Tani Hub and uh, different things. And I think the even also uh, Sonjo, uh, how we can help the farmers and then optimally to sell the product through this kind of hub. 
I think this is the what is it? Uh, three, uh, three question or suggestion that I would like to raise. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Taryono. Uh, Dr. Montero, would you like to give your comments? Uh, well, thank you. So these are really great questions, and and I know that uh, um, in in different governments do different types of support systems that are are are, are quite complementary of, of market based and, and I think that's that's what I, I, some of the issues that I, I was um, suggesting I don't know the situation of of, um, of uh, uh, um, tenancy agreements in, in, in your country uh, it is however has been you know extendedly studied I mean the problem sometimes that there is is whether governments really the problem that there is 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 is, is you know, and it, this has been studied in terms of, of different types of, of, of game theory type of, of, of models. Um, what seems to happen is that when when there is a, um, a reasonable divide of, of, of the output of the farm, um, there tends to be more stable relationships and and um, and less uh, and less issues of compliance with the contracts. It's typically when either the farmer or the the, the landlord um, tends to be a bit more abusive that that uh, the relationships can can break and, and things can happen. So I think what the government could do, uh, similar to potentially these contract farming situations, is 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 you know be vigilant and 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 somehow uh, uh, make sure that uh, that, that uh, um, neither the the, the the tenant then not the landlord uh, can actually uh, um, abuse of that position uh, with the other. But I think what you were suggesting there in terms of different types of organizations that uh, that can sort of uh, cooperate and, and sort of how do we actually foster cooperation and what is the role of government on fostering that cooperation? I think that's really... Uh, what what I think it's it could be the best avenue, um, you know. So maybe rather than the government shooting too much, is is making sure that um, he sets up a framework where corporate cooperation uh, is compensated and, and there's more benefits from cooperation than from from some 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 competition. That said, I mean we need to be we we, we need to be care, careful uh, because often. A bit of competition is actually important, not the negative competition that basically makes us uh, too greedy or, or too, uh, too aggressive to each other. But the competition that makes us improve all the time is certainly needed. So we need to kind of balance uh, uh, the insurances that we have with some level of, 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 of motivation to keep growing and to, 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 keep, um, to keep us on our toes. Uh, we've, so that that's... That sort of um, nice balance between cooperation on common on things that are are, are common goods uh, uh, and maybe competition on on more uh, um, you know that lead us to, to improve situations. I think this is this is where uh, these contracts also need to, to to have those elements there. And some of these might be these social uh, protection insurances uh, that uh, Elena was talking about. Maybe the government needs to to make sure that there is some sort of a floor uh, so that people don't totally fall on poverty, but at the same time, they, can, they, they, they cannot be too cozy in the sense that they cannot be too confident that it doesn't really matter how competent they are, you know, things will always sort out. I think that that is where uh, that balance between um, giving some protection, but also, but don't give people um, too much assurances uh, is, is, is often hard to get, but that's, I think uh, that's where we should probably move uh, forward in, in these markets, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Montero. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Pak Taryaro that uh, there's a new uh, trend now in Indonesia where the young people, uh, the youth, they use the technology uh, to uh, process the even the agricultural product like hub and also there is any other 
uh, young farmers group who really uh, you know help the farmer but see uh, they use the technology first and the second they use a group so that so, so that they can have a big bigger size uh, if you can train uh, many more young uh, you know uh, entrepreneurs who you know their heart is is gone to the farmers so i think that that will be a fruitful uh, and also a better uh, promising you know uh, for the the farmer to have more uh, a wider uh, market place okay and especially during uh, in this uh, online marketplace just like you know uh, they can sell to other places even with a small bag of uh, onion from brepus in central java and they can send it to other places that's that's really nice that's one of the example i heard that uh, our colleague from uh, ebb institute did also develop this kind of uh, uh, system to help you know young farmers to get together with a farmer group to uh, tani center baba yeah the tani center and also yeah, yeah, so yeah. i think But that's i think tani hub is more powerful than yeah well <laughs> Sonjo, i think it's also better yeah and some of them focus on agriculture and some of them also on social like sonjo so so yeah, yeah. yeah. i think if, if we have a you know young who the younger who uh, use the the power of it i think uh, it will be a good sign for our agricultural sector. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Chatter. Dr. Montero? Uh, no, I think this, I just comment a bit more on, on, on what uh, Katul has just said. I think one, one thing that is really interesting is, is how uh, um, these digital platform apps uh, are, are really addressing a lot of the issues that uh, that um, you know, governments have been trying to do for a long time and haven't been able to, to sort that out. So uh, the examples that uh, Katur uh, was describing are really interesting. I know that when I was there in, in Indonesia some time ago, uh, I learned about how extension is often uh, uh, done very effectively through um, mobile devices and, and all that. I think that that's really exciting to see how, how this is happening. I think as in, in, in universities and in, in, in institutions, we also need to kind of jump on board on this uh, as we could have been. Um, so how can we involve the, the knowledge institution as well on this uh, very exciting type of uh, uh, dynamic that is being created? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's something that we need to think about and start doing it more. Uh, but also the other thing that I think it's exciting is, is, is how these, these uh, uh, um, basically sort of private sector initiatives are, are, are putting consumers and farmers closer together. So I know of uh, a friend of mine in Portugal that uh, uh, um, is creating a cooperative between his farm and then uh, supply uh, produce uh, consumers that that buy directly from his farm through a, a, a community community supported agriculture type of scheme uh, where they, he sells directly and they know uh, uh, what is being produced. Some of them can actually come up and, and to the farm and, and help during crop season. So I think this bringing people, particularly urban dwellers, to the farm and and having understand that we all depend on each other. Um, I think that that's that's something that digital platforms have enabled these short circuits, uh, um, learning where your food comes from, learning the difficulties of that farmers face, uh, approaching and sharing ideas uh, um, and solutions is really interesting. We know examples also in Africa where people use uh, um, mobile to to send money. To each other, uh, um, I think again. I, I think that this is a really interesting space, and uh, and it's some uh, is it, an area that I think uh, Indonesia could potentially collaborate more effectively uh, with, with um, in Namibia and maybe other African countries on trying to really kind of empower uh, um, smallholder farmers to to can take 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 sort of responsibility for themselves, but also get the support they need to 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 develop themselves. Uh, I think that that's something that uh, I think we need to kind of find new models because some of the old models 
of just supporting uh, and sending subsidies potentially didn't work as much as 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 uh, we would like to think they would. So very exciting sort of a, a, yeah. a talk actually. All right, thank you, Dr. Montero, Pak Catur. Any yeah, uh, I wonder. I can I ask to Elena. I guess mm -hmm. we, when we're talking about small farmer in Indonesia, it's quite different from uh, you know small farmer yeah. in Africa. In Africa. Them yeah. of size, uh, you know. Okay. <laughs> you That's what. Well, that? yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was what I was wondering as well. How about in uh, Africa, especially maybe yeah. in Namibia case, uh, Elena? Because I was also wondering how about the digital digital transformations or maybe digital uh, disruption uh, may also help or maybe it's still a challenge uh, for farmers in Africa. Uh, would you enlighten us here, Dr. Elena? Yeah. Um... Yeah, of course, that's a challenge, a big challenge when it comes to talk about digital access or access to technology. Because if you look at many small scale farmers, um, actually, um, have the, it's a challenge in terms of this access to technology and things. So it will take time, in the, you know, to get there. Because, like I said, there needs to be, instead of, um, for example, saying, there is access to technology, there is what, they, they still training, they still need to train on how to use that, even if it comes to date. So um, that's, um, for example, with the, when in, in the past when I did um, some of the interviews I made with the small scale farmers, um, access to information was a big challenge. You would find that um, some of the information that uh, for example, it's on the Agricultural Bank of Namibia's website that they provide this kind of funding here and they, they have no information about that. You know, I would think, okay, is this an issue of, it could be an issue of, yeah, poor marketing maybe of products that are available, but also just the, the access to, to, to resources that could make it easy for them to be aware of this information is, is, is another thing. So that is one of the challenges when it comes to uh, to, to, to access technology for farmers as well, yeah. And um, if, if we can be enlightened as well, Alina, so, uh, uh, well, uh, from your presentation, so uh, what I take is that uh, during the COVID, uh, there's been an absence of social protections for farmers. So I, I was actually wondering, uh, so how, how, how then they cope with the current situations then? Of course, it's not to say there is nothing. There are interventions mm -hmm. that the government has put in place. Um, and um, the point here is that with all current interventions in place, you see, because that, that's why I mentioned that the social protection functions, we're talking about four functions, the promotive, protective, um, promotive, protective, preventive function and the transformative function. But you would find, for example, that only one or two taken into account. Of course, that works up to maybe 50%. What would take care of the other 50%? So look, like um, Diego said, farmers themselves are also not angels. It's a matter of <laughs> creating a relationship that works with what is currently available, right? And also working towards improving the current environment and not just saying, okay, we have this, it's working well. Let's look at the challenges later or let's see how we can deal with the challenges, but making sure that all the so protection uh, functions are, are present. So with the, how are they coping? Um, well, for example, in some of the uh, um, irrigation schemes with some of the small scale farmers, because I mostly focused on the crop farmers where they are, um, you'd find the, the government has tried to, 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 to put in um, some type of um, limited access to water, which may not always be available, sometimes available. So that works. It's it's kind of a way to cope from time to time, but uh, it just may be not sustainable, right? So with the current interventions, with the little that you say, that's how they, they cope. All right, uh, interesting. So I think before I ask one final question to each of our speakers, you from Ibu Mas uh, Ruwa, uh, okay, uh, uh, I would like to hear Ibu Mas Ruwa, um, uh, experience as well uh, regarding the COVID situations, Ibu, uh, whether we can learn something as well from the Indonesian case, from the practitioners. Uh, is there any uh, enough support from the government or not so that uh, we can compare with the Namibian case as well? as a practitioner, as the one who involved uh, in the field. Ibu Masaruto? Yeah, uh, for uh, 
during the pandemic, uh, we have to change our business model. Before pandemic, I focus on the export, but uh, everything changed after pandemic come, and uh, mm -hmm. I use uh, every tools for promote my, my product. I only have, a, I still have one buyers. Uh, they still order my uh, products, but we have a problem with the container. The container's price is very high. So uh, I, I received the order from the domestic, domestic market. And it's a problem because and uh, government in Yogyakarta uh, governor have a program to port a uh, PT Post Indonesia they have a program free delivery so my buyer can buy product and we can uh, send the products uh, um, with the C2, uh, yeah, free. Okay. So uh, in here in Yogyakarta, I get many support yeah, from uh, government to uh, my business. Okay, thank you once in a while. So, but definitely it changes the way you do your business, right? Okay, everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Montero, please. Yes. Uh, I was just kind of reflecting a bit of, uh, on what Elena was saying uh, and, and acknowledging that she works in, in, in a place where uh, some of the conditions to farming are, are pretty dire, um, you know, uh, desertic or, or semi-desertic areas are very challenging. Again, we know that water is the source of life and when there's not water, it's really hard to, to produce anything. Um, and what I think the problem sometimes is, uh, and I've seen that in my own country, in Portugal, um, where in the past, um, they, they kind of, uh, in some areas that are you know, not as, as the, as, uh, as arid as, as some parts of Namibia, but they certainly, you know, uh, during the summer, there's probably three mountains where there's no, no, no water in the south of Portugal, um, which makes it very challenging to produce anything. Um, but what we've seen as well there is that often you, you, you sort of uh, try to plant crops that um, in, in, in our case was wheat, uh, and some of the regions in the south didn't really had that, that much ability to actually, the land was not really good for wheat. There are some, some parts of the region that were good for it, the soils were appropriate, but a lot of that wasn't, but just because there was a need of, 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 of wheat for, for bread and all of that, which is a staple product in our, in our diets, um, they just start producing. And some of these lands, unfortunately, lost fertility because of that. So I'm kind of wondering if, if, if we need to think about uh, crops that are actually suitable for the regions, and, and that leads me to think about, you know, what we call food. Uh, um, you know, so, some, you know some, some things that we now assume that are foods, uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe they, 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 they weren't food some times ago, or, and that there were things that were eaten regularly, um, you know, like 100 years ago in Portugal that are, not, are, are now considered only food for animals. Uh, um, so, you know, I think in, in particularly in certain regions of the world, we need to kind of think about these insurances, uh, particularly when, when on, on, you know, on the perspective of climate change that actually might reduce water availability in certain regions. Uh, we need to think about that and, and maybe look at not local resources um, and, and, and that might provide some, some decent type of uh, uh, source of, of protein and other types of micronutrients. We need to think about food in, in, in a different way, potentially. Um, but also, I think we need to, to, to understand how farmers can help each other. So don't rely only on government. Obviously, government needs to be there on situations of emergency. But maybe farmers could also cooperate 
and maybe some save some some of their crops uh, for situations of emergencies, particularly if in if they are in regions where it's likely that every so often there will be serious problems of food security. So I think we need to be be a bit more creative uh, 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 and find different solutions um, to these these issues. Can kind of be a bit more open minded about what we can see the food and what we don't see the food. And this is just reflections I'm having looking at the situation in my own country that potentially could be useful for others. All right, a very uh, insightful and very interesting, Dr. Montero. Thank you very much for uh, your comments. Uh, but I'm afraid we really run out of, of the time. So I have to wrap up this plenary sessions. But before I close this session, I would like to ask one more question uh, to each of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, our speaker today. Um, just like the final message for, uh, for this webinar and to all of our participants, because uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we will have a series of future webinars uh, in the same topic and also to enhance and or uh, give more support for uh, uh, contract farming farmers and also the SMEs as well. So for each of our speaker, I would like to have your two cents, uh, your ideas or your comments. So um, if you can summarize in one sentence, sorry, just a, a short uh, summary, what will be the most important factors or maybe elements that we need to focus on to have that form of sustainable contract farming, perhaps, or any sustainable policies uh, to support our SMEs, especially in the agricultural sector. So I would like to start with Professor Chatur. Wow, it's hard. <laughs> oh, it's hard. <laughs> really? So it's not an exam, uh, Prof. So yeah, just your final point. From your point of view, what would be the well, key yeah. elements here? Well, I would be more optimistic with this current mm -hmm. situation. Uh, as long as, you know, the government go into the IT thing and then, you know, keep the farmer group uh, uh, online. Uh, and I, I think that's that will be a promising uh, uh, direction for helping our uh, farmers yeah okay thank you professor professor chatur how about dr elina especially in your experience in uh, africa i would say um a truly sustainable reduction in, in, in poverty and um resources to farming it, 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 a truly sustainable reduction in poverty requires a deep investment in in, in rural areas where, especially where most of the small scale farmers live and a, a, a reduction in the instability of food commodity, food security, serious labor market reforms and secure financing schemes need to be looked at for, for, for households where, you know, or for farmers where food is, is, is um, produced. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, thank you, Dr. Elena. Dr. Montero? Um, Dr. Yes. I know. I, I, no. Sorry. <laughs> no uh, worries. I would say that uh, one key key issue is, is really sharing, uh, sharing problems, sharing solutions, uh, learning from each other. I think it's key that we, we, we realize that a lot of the problems that we are facing uh, are not ours alone, uh, either personally or, or regionally or nationally. Um, you know, we just had the, the COP26 meetings here in, in Glasgow, which is not very far from where I am. Uh, and, and what we saw there is, is actually, rather than cooperation, people thinking that, you know, their interests prevail other, over others. I mean, we facing as, as, as a human community uh, uh, a huge challenge going to the future. We have huge problems, but I think we... I'm a believer that we, if we can sit together uh, as we are over a room and we can discuss those problems uh, and, and have some sense of solidarity with each other uh, and a sense of wanting to learn and wanting to address issues, uh, um, we, can, we can prevail. Uh, we've, been, we've been around for a while as, as a species. I think we, can, we, can, we are at our best when we, we come together uh, to um, to identify uh, issues and to 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 address them, uh, and, and again, I think there's a lot of experiences that we we learn about today that can be shared and can be used. Obviously, adapting to the circumstances can be used uh, to 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 inspire and, and to address the critical issues that we all face. 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Montero. Last but not least, from our uh, very own practitioner, Ibu Masruro. So, what will be, Ibu, from uh, the message from your experience, what will be the key element to support you, particularly, or in particular, uh, to enhance your business? Uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, as an SMA, uh, I want to uh, tell that. We have to know about our target, and we have to know about our strategy. Uh, like we we, co- we have to collaborate or cooperate with others, uh, keep growing, and never give up. We have to be active okay. to get uh, information for the others. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu Masruro, for your very fine final message for this uh, plenary session. So everyone, that is the end of our discussion ses- uh, session. So if I can just summarize, just a short summary. Um, so about the benefits of contract farming, we've seen that, yes, it's uh, it will be beneficial to enhance farmers' income, but there are challenges, one of which is about asymmetric information, moral hazard, and selection bias uh, as well. Uh, but uh, we have opportunities, all the opp- opportunities can also be challenges uh, about uh, providing better social protection, utilizing the the digital transformations, and having better infrastructure to support our SMEs. And the final message is about collaboration. Uh, What I quote from Dr. Montero, if I can have uh, uh, your quotation, compensating cooperation to motivate uh, cooperation for the common good. So I think uh, that's also the final uh, message from Ibu Masrurwa. We need collaboration. So I think that will be our uh, future discussions, hopefully, if Pak Chatur's and team will have such a, a webinar again. So everyone, I'm going to make my closing now. I would like to thank all of our participants who have joined us today, especially those who stayed until the end. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to all of our speakers, uh, Dr. Elina, Dr. Montero, Professor Chatur, Ibu Masrura, and I think uh, Omar was here, but yeah, I think uh, he got some connections problem as well. And thank you all, uh, all the committees from Pusat Studi Ekonomi Kerakyatan Universitas Gejo Mada uh, for holding this event and who have assisted me in today's plenary session. So I hope to see you all again in other events held by Universitas Gejo Mada or even uh, University of Namibia or maybe in University of Newcastle. Um, uh, yeah, in other events, uh, similar events or maybe other webinars. But until then, uh, I would like to say always stay safe, stay healthy. Remember always to keep the health protocols and regulations in your country. So that's it for me. This is Keisha signing off. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And back to you, Ibu Saka. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so very much, Mrs. Kisha and all speakers. Thank you so very much. Uh, what a great presentation and discussion led by Mrs. Kisha. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting any of time, let's continue to the next agenda. Next program, we will have to closing remarks from our honorable invited guests. First closing remarks will be delivered by Dr. Jacob Nyambe, the executive Dean of the Faculty of Commerce, Management and Law of University of Namibia. Please, Dr. Jacob. Dr. Jacob, can you hear my voice? Are you here with us? Dr. Jacob uh, Nyambe. Just, just bear with me, I'm trying to, can you see me now? Okay. Yeah, um, anyway, let me just take this opportunity to say a few words. I won't take you for long. I know the event has already taken some time. On your side, it should even be, I guess, late in the afternoon, uh, if, if not approaching evening. Um, I'll start by referring to the words of uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Kenneth Matengu, uh, who, encouraged for the involvement of the private sector in some of the research work that is taking place between the two sister institutions. But I think it's a, it's a very commendable exercise that should be pursued. Uh, but besides that, of course, I also want to draw from the words of uh, Dr. Tariono, who spoke from the University of Gajamada. Um, I recall he emphasized the fact that, um, of course, there are constraints that uh, small scale farmers, in this case, from the small business enterprise perspective, 
uh, they suffer from a lot of constraints that should be attended to. Uh, I mean, it's normal. It's normal for all of us to expect such because uh, these are humans who face difficult challenges that um, all other businesses go through. But with these words, allow me first to start by thanking the presenters. Um, and I recall um, we had Dr. Montero, uh, who touched on contract farming. Um, we appreciate the work that you did on that um, because it enlightened us on, on a number of issues, uh, especially how the chocolate or cocoa farmers are supporting the industry. Um, of course, we wish we could have the same here in Namibia to, to introduce cocoa, but uh, it's, it's unfortunate. We, I don't know whether there's our environmental conditions that don't allow such, or is because we haven't gone to the level of testing for such, but we appreciate that, of course. Um, Prof. Um, Sugianto as well, he touched again on, on, on a number of issues that also have to do with contract farming, uh, telling us about um, the types of contracts, but of pertinence was more of a relational contract. Uh, that is also appreciated. We thank you again for your presentation. Um, Dr. Madila, you also went to the issue of social protection among small scale farmers. Um, that is, that's quite an interesting, I mean, aspect considering where we are with COVID and areas that lies ahead with uh, ensuring that small scale farmers can remain resilient. Um, of course, there are others uh, like uh, Dr. Nadia as well, and uh, someone uh, by the name Solistio T, who, who came to, to touch on um, issues to do with identifying the market and so forth. I think that is, that's wonderful for us. Uh, these are very practical or quite um, hands-on types of research that I mean, can find a way to influence policy. So we really appreciate your, your work that you did, um, sharing with us the knowledge and telling us what, what needs to be done from a policy perspective. Um, I don't have to leave it there. I need to thank, um, I think Professor Mandemele, who has been in contact with us and the University of Kajamata. Um, I think we came here because, because of that type of effort. We also recognize uh, those who have organized this uh, webinar to take place. Uh, thank you for your work. Uh, we have done the background work that we couldn't even see and notice, but at least you made it a success. Um, the director of ceremonies, I think, uh, including the moderators who came on board, uh, your work was also commendable. We, we appreciate what you've done. Um, they are then those who were listening, were asking questions, uh, who are the invited guests. Uh, we also want to thank you for coming, for, for having uh, endured this time attending to this knowledge platform. And we hope that in future you will again join us when we have similar events. Uh, from all others that I did not recognize, please uh, let me also thank you. Uh, and please continue to look after yourselves in times of COVID until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Um, ladies and gentlemen, now we will continue to next closing remarks by UGM representatives. A few words from the expertise of the Center for Economic Democracy Studies of Universitas Gajah Mada. Professor Chatur Sugianto, please. Thank you, uh, honorable speakers and also guests. I hope all of you found a fruitful discussion this evening. We discuss very important topics and very relevant to Indonesian and also to Namibia. I hope. As Mr. Tariano mentioned in the opening, SME contribute to a large share in labor absorption and also in the business in general. I hope this is not the end of the session because I believe we have not covered the whole problem of SME. Contract versus tenancy, for example, contract in the land and a contract in products, gender, government failure, and so on and so on. So uh, looking forward to see you again. It is also interesting to have a comparative studies on SME, I guess. I appreciate Dr. Montero and also Elina on this issue. Also Ibu Masurura on giving us an issue and problem on SME in the craft uh, sector. 
I think uh, this is our proposal. I, if we could produce like a written publication on this discussion to reach more ideas, to give them more, uh, you know, perspective, and not only two hours discussion, you know, I think and that will be fruitful, I mean, beneficial to our, our ideas as well. Also, uh, I would like to read a greeting from our vice rector as this event is a giant event from UGM and UNAM. So she highly appreciate to the UNAM for this collaboration and propose to keep the program on. Last but not least, uh, to the webinar team, Lisa, our smart and energetic moderator, we are having a great time. So we're looking forward to next opportunity for having a webinar again. Thank you for the participant and I see you in the next program. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Professor Jatur. And the closing remarks have been delivered indicating that our program is already done. Thank you so very much for your enthusiasm and participation and for your attendance in this Zoom. We remind you to fill the attendance form by click the link which we have already sent to you in chat box. I, Kotamara, hereby and my duty as the Master of Ceremony on behalf of the organizing committee would like to apologize if we have made any, any mistakes throughout the webinar. And we really do hope it will be fruitful for all of you. Once and for all, thank you and see you on the next Web Indo Africa Center. Stay safe and stay healthy. Good day to all of you. See you, thanks. Thank, thank you, you everyone. So thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank, bye. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye. you very much. It's. Yes.